Now, one thing um, I noticed when we were over there is we talked about the stability ball. Yes. Okay. Now, you've worked with special kids in the past. Yes. Right. And you said in Philly was the first time you were like a teacher. Eighth grade math, you said? Yes, it was eighth grade math and science, actually. But um, I, that Philly wasn't the first time. I was a teacher in Amman, Jordan for three years. Right. Yeah. Right. And your your friend Stephanie, right? Who? Janan. Janan. Yeah, yes. Janan. Yeah, she met you there. Yes. Okay. So when someone sees you for the first time, like when I yeah. saw you for the first time, I would have never thought, oh, she was in Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Maybe she wears Air Jordans, but... <laughs> She's definitely hasn't been to Jordan. So um, tell me the the motivation, sort of the story behind why you would, first of all, become a teacher, because that profession is like not fun because mm -hmm. both of my parents did that until they retired. Right. Right. right for I mean, long, my dad, I think at least 10 years uh -huh. um, and then my mom for at least like six or seven. Wow. But they told me horror stories. Yep. And I wanted to curse and, and moon the, those, those, those departmental people and then tell them to like, you know, go to hell and then like have my parents leave that school. So they suffered, especially my mm -hmm. dad, because he got bullied and he got made fun of and a lot of terrible things happen, you know, high blood pressure, like yeah. not good. So what motivates someone like you to become a teacher? Right. Well, first of all, what age groups uh, was your, were your parents teaching? My dad did high school. Yes. Okay. And my mom did a little bit less than that. So elementary, fourth grade, fifth grade, but they were switching a lot. Got like it. Like my mom was substituting. So she had a, a whole right. range, but my dad stuck to like science, you know, biomedical type stuff because mm -hmm. he's a doctor, mm -hmm. but in Pakistan. Yeah. So in America, he was unable to get the certification. So he couldn't become a doctor here yeah. like in America. So uh, he just ended up teaching. You know, what's really, really funny so my mother is a doctor. My mother is a primary care physician. And when I was a kid, I wanted to be her. I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and the reason why was because whenever we would go into grocery stores, her, these random people would come up to her and say, hi, Dr. Dunnell, like, thank you so much for treating so-and-so. Like, I feel so much better. And I, I just thought that's really cool. Like she's, she's helping people and people are, are happy and excited about it and grateful for it. And so I said, I want to help people in that way too. So I went to Villanova. That was my undergraduate college in Philly. And I, I was a biology major for undergrad. And I, I had an, an amazing time. I, I love learning genetics. Like I still to this day, I love curling up on a Sunday night with like a peer review. Wow. <laughs> like I, I am, I'm a nerd in and out. But um, while I was there, I, I was going through the middle chapter, I guess, so to speak, of some of my personal mental health, a uh, uh, long-term battle with anxiety and depression. And um, because of some events right around then, uh, I I couldn't handle the, the one of the courses that I was taking that I needed to, to be a biology major. So I actually had to switch my major. So I switched to global interdisciplinary studies with a focus. Um, no, I hadn't, didn't have a focus yet. Just global interdisciplinary studies, because I said, okay, I, I know I don't want to, I know I don't want to actually spend the rest of my life or what I felt was the rest of my life because it's like seven, eight years, right? Just taking more med school. So I want to learn about the world. I want to, I want to learn about things beyond just this small town of Villanova. So I grew up in Boston. Boston is a predominantly Irish Catholic town. Here I am half Asian, a quarter Hungarian, quarter Polish, another, another American mutt, right? And um, so I went to the suburb that I lived in was predominantly white. And then the college that I went to was predominantly white. And something just kind of struck me when, when being a dedicated biology major wasn't working out. I was like, I, I want to know what more there is to this world. And so I became a GIS major. And one of the courses that I ended up taking was uh, a liberal arts class and like why the liberal arts. And so I was digging into philosophy and I was digging into um, so much more history than I had ever done, right? You're a science major, like you kind of kick that stuff to the side. And I, I loved thinking about humans and what motivates us to do anything. And, and so I said, okay, I, I want to get, I want to know 
what the purpose of our education system is. And I wrote my senior thesis on the purpose of public school in America, asking what its purpose is. And I, it was invented to teach us to become good citizens, right? But does it do that? Like, what is citizenship these days? What, is, what, is the, what does it mean to give your part of the social contract and what are we getting back these days? And so I just thought that was a fascinating question. And so what I wanted to do then is my senior year of college, I studied abroad in Copenhagen and I spent half the year there. And it was so cool because in these Scandinavian countries, they, they fund education a little bit differently and they regard the teaching profession a little bit differently. And um, so while I was there, the, these teachers really knew their students. These class sizes were smaller. They were like 15 kids. And actually the kids stayed with their group and then and kind of in the same room year after year, and then the teachers would rotate. So it was almost like the kids had these, this stability, this like nuclear kind of family aspect to it. And sure, they had bullying issues and stuff, but there was so much more of a tighter community aspect that they, they were able to resolve conflict differently, it seemed. And so I said, cool, I can, I can teach and, and travel because my mentor there, she had traveled in, and taught in different schools around the world. And I said, I want to do that. So that's what led me to become a teacher internationally, is I said, I can teach in any school around the world and, and do something I'm passionate about, um, but also learn more about the world. So I went to a, a job fair my fall of my, no, excuse me, my February of my senior year of college, and I went country shopping <laughs> to try to see which school would let me teach, given the fact that I was just graduating. I didn't really have any real world experience. Um, and I, I only had the, the teaching, uh, verifications that my major would give me. And, um, I interviewed with South Korea, Morocco, China, um, and Jordan. And I, I settled on, on Jordan and I was scared that my parents would say no if I told them I was going. So I actually signed, read, I had a friend of a friend read the contract <laughs> that knew the legal backing. And I signed that contract without telling my parents or asking them. <laughs> So I came home and I was like, hey, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to Jordan. And they were shocked. <laughs> they were so shocked. And I remember I, I, I felt badly that when I wanted to ease my, my mom's fear. So I actually brought them with me to like the last day of this job fair to talk to the head of the school. And just because in, in, in America, I mean, how many misconceptions do we have about the Middle East? Like, we're not, we don't even need to get into that. <laughs> But um, when I lived in Jordan, I felt safer there than I did in the U.S. as a woman. Day to day on the street. Um, I, I've, I love Jordan. I found, and to any, anyone listening that, that isn't familiar with, with the area or Middle Eastern culture or, or specifically Jordanian culture, you probably know an Italian. <laughs> and I love to say that mo often I, Jordanians are... <laughs> are kind of like Italians without the alcohol if they choose not to drink. <laughs> Big families, super hospitable, just inviting you in, like giving you the clothes off their back, like huge meals, delicious meals. And, and they're like, like just so lively. They're, they're just such wonderful people. So I, I had a blast teaching there. I was at the King of Jordan's boarding school, which is something. It's called King's Academy, and I'm so grateful for my experience there. Um, and I taught high school and um, freshman biology and sophomore chemistry. So I kept my bio major. And so that's my way that I was able to share my love of science. And class sizes were small. They were, I think I had a chemistry class of 10 kids and the experiments that we were able to do. I taught atomic radius using tug of war. <laughs> we wrote protons and electrons. I taught combustion doing s'mores. Um, we built models of the cell membrane out of balloons that and hung them from the ceiling with pool floats. Uh, we had, it was such a cool school. Um, we taught buoyancy with a, uh, a cardboard boat race in the, in the pool. It was, we had gardens. I, my freshman biology class, we planted a garden. Um, and it was, it taught me what you can do with, with resources. How much can you teach kids? How much can you teach anyone with, with a properly funded school? 
And then um, three years later, I, I was like, I get what I can do with, with full resources. I'm ready for a challenge. <laughs> so I, I asked and I, I got myself one. I moved to Philadelphia and I taught in Philadelphia public schools at Feltonville uh, School of Arts and Sciences. And my first class there was a 30 student special education eighth grade class. And I thought I had teaching experience. Boy, I, I did not. <laughs> I did not. But I knew what you could do with education. I knew what you could do in a classroom. And so my experience in Philly taught me to be resourceful, taught me to be patient. And it taught me that the most important thing it definitely taught me was that no matter what you, when you are teaching someone anything, whether it's a personal training client or a nutrition client or a student in a classroom, you are treating the whole person. And kind of as we discussed earlier, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety needs need to be met. Physiological needs need to be met. Like the environmental or social relational. And then maybe there's, a, there's maybe if there's nothing else going on, right? There's hope of, of allowing a, a new habit or concept or skill to stick. But, but when we don't care for the whole person, we, we, we aren't able to be as effective as teachers, as coaches, as of anything. Um, and exactly probably how your parents felt, right? It was hard. Oh my gosh, it was hard. Um, and I personally had a lot of trouble in, in middle school. I felt like fitting in. And the thing that I cherish so much about that experience was one-to-one -one or really small group conversations with these kids, learning about what they were struggling with and telling them, like, I promise you, being a middle schooler, like, you won't worry about so many of these things in life or, or how to handle bullying or, or low self-esteem, low, low self-confidence or friends that want to not drag you into the greatest habits, right? I, I loved and I, I cherish and I'm so grateful for those conversations because I hope I was able to teach these students something about life, but they definitely taught me so, so much about life and um, the importance of community, the importance of, of um, the importance of community and no matter how many or how few resources you have. Um, and just, I, I'm just in awe, in awe of, of how hard those kids work because they're in, they, they, have you ever seen like the privilege walk? It's a, it's a video that a lot of new teachers end up watching. It's basically everyone, you have a hundred people and it's this random, it's a, on YouTube. So you can Google this like uh, uh, privilege walk. Um, you have hundred people standing on a line, uh, men, women, different races. And um, there's a person standing over here and says like, take 10 steps forward. If you grew up in a household with two parents, if you, um, if you didn't have to pay for college, if you had an extra car in the family, if you took vacations, like, um, and so you, you just, there was a point, there's a, after the experiment kind of is run, you just see the stratification of people. And then you see he, at the end of the video, this guy says, this shows you just how much harder some people have to push, even given the same opportunity. And, and you just, you just look back on humanity with anger that there is such striration, but genuine awe in, in the beauty of humanity to, of resilience. Um, that is an extreme, uh, extremely long winded way of, of answering <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> how that's I became okay. a teacher, that's the whole point. but, that's um, the whole point. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's how I became a teacher and my, my colleagues and I, we were, there, I said they were really, really hard days. Um, and you got really burned out, really burned out. We had, we all timed our six days. Like wow. we were either actually sick or you had, we had very limited sick days. And I remember February, March is just like the longest teaching window. There's no American holidays, no three day weekends. And so I always knew I would need a mental health holiday. Like I would need a, a day off then. Wow. Yeah. One thing, Rachel, you mentioned um, about the system, 
right? And this is very interesting to me because what I learned is that the American educational system was designed by Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, is because he wanted factory workers mm -hmm. for Ford com yes. Motor Company. Yes. And so the way he designed it is like, okay, we, they have to wake up at this time. Then they go to different, you know, assembly line, yes. right? They go or, or they're staying in the same class or they're moving from class to class. The point is there's quizzes, there's homework, there's rote, right? Memorization. And someone raises their hand. Hey, it's not time to ask questions yet. Put your hand down, right? And then the teachers are designed like the bosses, right? You have to do this. You have to come at this time. Lunch is at this time. Break is at this time. P is at this time. So nowadays, you have people like Jordan Peterson who are starting their own school, right? Peterson Academy starting, I think, this month or maybe next month. And uh, one of the guys, um, Dr. William Farrell, he wrote The Boy Crisis. And uh, he told me that Jordan Peterson had asked, has asked him to make a course for this, for this university. So already now there's this system of let's forget about the traditional schools. Let's make something online accessible to everyone. Maybe make it one tenth or maybe one fiftieth, right? Depending on where you go of the price. So people aren't in debt after. And let's teach them analytical skills, comprehensive, you know, comprehension, reading comprehension, the ability to ask questions. You know, like you said, it's um, the, the, the kids in Amman, when they were learning, they were learning so they can retain that information and actually use it and have fun with it. But nowadays, and even if you look at the system of American education, p kids aren't really having fun in, in, in how they learn from what I've seen. I mean, I went through the American system too, right? I did elementary. I started in fourth grade, you know, from Pakistan when we moved, I was in fourth grade. Um, so all the way up to high school and then undergrad. So um, what do you see as the future of the education system? And also how would you like to see it? That's an excellent, excellent question. So there are, there's a lot behind that. So let's, in order to answer where, um, where the future is going, let's start with the present. So presently, you have, you have several different types of systems. You have, at the top, you have public schools, you have private schools, and then somewhere in between the two are charters. So charter schools are technically private schools funded by the government. Um, and one thing that was absolutely fascinating to learn when I did my undergrad thesis was how public schools are funded. Public school systems in the United States are predominantly funded by local taxes, not state and not federal. So the amount of funding that, a public, that your local public school receives depends on the income of, of your little town, of your little community. And No Child Left Behind kind of cemented that with standardized testing um, to, to also kind of regulate how much funding the, the government is. And that, that might not be, that may have changed since now, uh, since, since the last time I took a look at that research, it's been a little while, but, but generally it's, it's mostly local taxes. So if you're in a, if you're in a challenging, challenging neighborhood with um, low socioeconomic mobility, the school reflects that. And that this is why we get into these, these generational wealth cycles and these, these, these kind of traps. It's, it's really hard to get, to, as we just discussed with the privilege walk, it's really hard to, to be successful in an already underfunded school with, um, with, with people that have a lot of trauma. And then on top of that, in your public schools, so sorry, I got caught up for a second. <laughs> so your public schools, charter, private. Um, in those public schools, predominantly funded by the local government, um, public school curricula is also state mandated 
state mandated, um, but then uh, what's it called? Um, district kind of tuned, and so to speak. So, for example, like um, your standardized tests at the end of the year, they are like the Pennsylvania ones, but the Philadelphia school district created um, like fine tuned the order of the curricula, specifically what might little cuts and additions or something like that. So that's why if a kid goes is in California versus Texas versus Mississippi versus Massachusetts, they aren't learning the same things and they might be learning them in different orders too. So um, that goes to say at the public school, you have the curriculum mandated by the state tinkered by the district and therefore teachers have very little autonomy because there's a, there's, they are being graded on how effective they are as a teacher based on how well their kids do on standardized tests. <laughs> and um, your pay isn't allowed to reflect that. But in, uh, in terms of conversations with principals and in professional development, like that, the outcome of your students on those tests does drive those conversations. Like, um, if students aren't scoring high enough in one area, people will be like, what, what are you doing? Are you really teaching? What's going on? So that's, that's public schools, basically. Um, then just one second. Yeah. My dad, um, he's, he always told me that his bosses, right? Principals and whatnot. They told him to keep the students busy. So he wasn't necessarily audited on test scores simply because, hey, he ain't the only teacher, right? There's like maybe 10, five to 10 teachers. So, hey, well, hey, it wasn't me. It was that guy. He, he should have taught this, right? And I know, and, and the test you're talking about, so in Texas, we have the TAS, mm -hmm. yes. T-A-A-S. Yes. I took this test. Yep. I remember. Um, and as a student, I, I had no idea what the hell this, yeah. like, I just took it. Like, okay, yeah. whatever. Um, and you're telling me that the standardized tests are what is used as a metric for student success, but why is, what I'm saying is, why is the, why is it this test, right? Like, like a simple example, they could simply have a test, which is for physical fitness, right? You're a trainer, you know, but there's no test like that or an emotional intelligence test. I mean, I don't think these are hard to do, right? There is the, the test that is designed, someone designed it for a purpose. So do we know what the end, I mean, is it like a Henry Ford type guy who designed this test? Oh goodness, wow. So, in a short answer, yes. Let's go all the way back to the creation of Harvard University. This is, Massachusetts is a, is a fascinating microcosm of how public school systems developed. So Harvard University, who was it founded? It was founded um, by elite individuals to teach their children how to continue to hold power. Okay. Right? And so when we take a look at the difference between private and public institutions, the reason private institutions, private schools were created was because they saw shortcomings with the public school system, right? That's private. Why it's, there's an incentive. Public school is free. Why would you want to have to pay only if the outcome is going to be higher? So private schools are, they are subjected to some, some rules to stay in operation, but, but they're, they're funded by the tuition, they don't depend on local taxes to stay alive. So they can go off the book and they can teach whatever they want, basically. So you that's why you have Montessori schools. You have um, uh, online schools, kind of like that, like what you're talking about. You have the Khan Lab School, which was invented during the pandemic. And these are- the, This is Khan Academy. Yes. This became Khan Lab. I didn't know. Yes, yes. Wow. And so um, reverse, actually. So Khan, uh, Khan Academy Online- that uh, they just decided to open up like a school to uh, uh, an interpersonal relationship school uh, a couple of years ago during the pandemic. But so based on, based on that understanding, you have private institutions, you have public institutions. 
why would you, why would you send your kid to a private school? Because you want them to have a higher quality education. What does it, what does it mean? What does it mean to have a higher quality education? And I think this is another reason why I coach the way I do right now, honestly. What do we, what do we want our kids to learn in school? Ideally, you want them to learn how to critically think, how to problem solve, how to work in teams, how to work with other people, how to be an altruistic human, um, how to be healthy, right? That's not something that we, that last one, that's, I saw a lot of deficits in that when in public schools. Um, so we have, so when, when private schools are able to take a much more um, direct approach at what do we want to teach our children? Because they don't they're not bound by state curricula. They're not bound by local curricula. They, they get to teach exactly whatever they want. So they're far more adaptive year by year, week by week. Teachers end up usually, at least from my personal experience, and again, I didn't work in the United States. I worked in one school in the Middle East, and so this just might be my experience, but I had so much greater flexibility over my curricula um, and, and how I taught it and what projects I did. And so, so that's the main, that's the main difference. Charter schools, um, charter schools are complex and they're, they're a hot topic right now. Uh, there is a voucher system. So sometimes if, um, public schools aren't doing well enough or there's, they're too crowded, local governments will give vouchers to charter schools, to families. So that means they can, you have a voucher to a charter school. You can kind of pick whichever one in the area you can go to. There are some public education systems in the United States, specifically in larger metropolitan cities that are, um, they're just too big. And I think it, it's, I mean, we live in a time, right, where we are trying to teach kids industrial uh, uh, age skills, right, in, a, in 2022 with the advent of social media and TikTok, and we have declining attention span. We have a declining attention spans and increasingly uninteresting information in an increasingly uninteresting way being presented to kids. So no wonder there's a huge rise in ADHD. Of course there is. The system's broken. Um, and, and that is why it's really, it's a challenge for educators, it's a challenge for families, it's, ch it's a challenge for students. And that's why more and more and more people are moving towards charter schools and are moving towards private schools. So based on that current reality, what I, what I foresee is the continuance of, um, of families leaving public education, trying their best to get into charters or moving towards public schools. I don't, I don't see an uptick coming in, in online only schools, because here's why. I have, you are a kindergarten teacher in an online class. <laughs> How are you gonna do that? You're teaching, and I think what we forget as, as just people is at every age from, I mean, they say adulthood ends at 25 right now, right? Like you're still learning interpersonal skills. You're still learning emotional skills, and so, even, even though they might say, oh, elementary school teachers, you have the most, like we need to keep that in person. No, you really, you are constantly teaching people about being human, Ta constantly teaching kids about being human at every age. And so I, um, I found during my year and a half of teaching on front of a green screen to a class of Zoom kids that they, you lose, they get so far behind in term in in social emotional skills like we came back and we were like why are you all not able to read each other like they, they literally could not read each other they when they were talking they were more argumentative they were more talking over one another they were not able um like emotional regulation um empathy felt different it it was really hard to teach right after the pandemic when they all came back that was really, really, really hard because all of a sudden we had to put off subject matter and like reteach them how to talk to each other. <laughs> wow. One thing uh, that comes to mind is the importance of this 3D interaction, right? That's what you're talking about. So um, I don't know if you've heard about the 
um, Stanley Milgram experiments where he brought people in and the t- they were shocking. Um, there was like a, 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 the subject, the client was like strapped to these electrical um, uh, straps. Mm-hmm. And then the person in the other room would, it would be a memory test. And as, as soon as the person failed, there's a button and then it would like zap the person. And the experiment was, how much are you going to obey authority, right? And when you when you tell me about how you can teach on Zoom in this three D world, I mean two two D world, not being exposed to the the body language, the the you know pheromones is a is a is a hard you know there's no like hardcore proof yet right. that that humans can do pheromones, but you know maybe there's something there, right? Um, there is this aspect of emotional intelligence yes. that develops for some reason mm-hmm. in 3D. And and what happened, the reason I brought this up is, um, so, so let, let me tell you what this experiment was. So uh, Stanley Milgram, who was also, um, he was a classmate of Philip Zimbardo, who did the Stanford prison experiment. Oh, wow. They were classmates in the same. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so Milgram, um, his basically... Uh, his thesis was, okay, in Nazi Germany, there were lots of soldiers Mm -hmm. and sort of pawns who obeyed Hitler, Mm -hmm. the Third Reich, the Third Reich. And uh, in hindsight, we say, oh, you know what? I wouldn't have done that. There's there's no way. I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm. So he's like, oh, really? Let's see how bad people are. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so he designed this experiment where he asked, um, with, this was at Yale, so it was New Haven, Connecticut, the city. So he basically, you know, sent out a, a, a newspaper, said, hey, you know, $4 per day, which is a you know, decent amount of money at the time. And uh, you come in, it's, you know, the whole day's experiment. And basically, um, it's a memory test. And, and you're going to be either a teacher or a student. Right. So he brought people in and they would be sitting on a chair, but one of them was hired by Yale. It was a Yale employee, but the other guy didn't know. So he would be like, okay, here's a hat. One of these says teacher, one of these says student. Let's mix it up. Here, pick one. But the thing is, both of them was were teacher. Right? So the, the guy was rigged. It was a rigged thing. So the the you know the, the participant, he would pick it out. He's like, Oh, I'm a teacher. He's like, okay, here, come with me. So th- what they would do is they would strap the student to uh, you know electrical whatever right like electrocuted thing, and he would be sitting like this, and then he would they would tell the teacher you know, it was just called the teacher but it's like a random mm-hmm. guy he's mm-hmm. like okay this is what happens when you you know do an electric shock, and when the teacher pressed the button he's like zzz, zzz, like that, but in the real experiment there was no such thing yeah why because the teacher was on the other side. And he could hear the 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 the, the subject, you know, the 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 student. He yeah. could just hear him, right? Because the the student had to answer the memory test, yeah. right? The memory test was very simple. It was like um, blue goes with hat, uh, red goes with glass, right? And 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 they would have to remember this. And then then he would say, where what what does red go with? Four choices: computer, microphone, glass, or teeth. And it'd be like teeth, right? And the thing was, the the actual device that they had for electrocution had one one to thirty levels of voltage, right? So it started off with fifteen, then you know twenty, twenty five, thirty, all the way to four hundred and fifty volts, which is basically you 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 know it's very close to death. It's like a, what they do in the electrocute you know the machine, mm-hmm. and it had little labels so. Uh, you know, severe, dangerous, extremely dangerous, mm-hmm. caution, you know, like there's all these different right. verbal text. Now, the, the, the thing was, they brought the, the teacher in and they would say, okay, when the student gets a question wrong, you're going to press this button. Right. Then when he gets the next question wrong, you keep increasing the voltage. You keep increasing. And they wanted to know how many of them would go all the way to 30, the, 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 the last voltage, which is 450 volts, but it was 30 steps. And they wanted to know, okay, what percentage of people 
would actually go to 450 volts with certain feedback from the student. Now, what was the feedback? At a certain voltage, around 150, mm -hmm. the, the student would say, please stop. I can't take this anymore. It is painful to me. And then, then he would, you know, keep complaining, keep complaining. And then around 200 volts, he'd be like, I don't want to do the experiment mm -hmm. anymore. I, I'm feeling, I'm feeling a lot of pain. Please stop. Mm -hmm. I do not want to participate. Now, the thing was, the experimenter had four sentences that he always had to say mm -hmm. to the teacher. So, you know, the teachers, they were panicked. They're like, oh my God, I'm hurting the student in the other room. So the teacher would look at the, the, the you know, the scientist, right? Be which is the authority. You know, he was in a white lab coat, very like professional Yale University, right? So he would look at the experimenter and be like, hey, I can't hurt this guy. Like, he, he might die in there. And the experimenter had a, a, a line to say, like a robotic. The experiment requires that you go on. And then, and then if he argued again, there was a second line. Please continue the experiment. Mm -hmm. And there was four lines like that. And the only way the experiment would stop, there's two, two ways the experiment would stop. First way is the teacher would argue, first sentence, second sentence, third sentence, fourth sentence. If he kept arguing, for those four sentences, the experiment would stop. Meaning he didn't obey authority. Mm -hmm. He like, he rebelled. Mm -hmm. However, the other way the experiment would stop is at 450 volts, they would give three shocks. And Rachel, at this moment, the, 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 the student had stopped responding. So the teacher knew that that guy in the room who has been screaming for those oh 30 trials is no longer responding. And you know, when, the, when, when he would say to the experimenter, hey, he's not talking anymore. He's not mm -hmm. responding anymore. The experimenter's job was to say, if he doesn't respond, count it as a wrong answer and go to the next shock. So this was Stanley Milgram experiment oh at Yale. And... I want you to guess what percentage of people went all the way to 30 and shocked three times, 450 volt shock three times. I'm honestly betting 75% or something. Like Very that. close. Two thirds. Yeah. Two thirds. I mean, you, you know the human condition. But at that time, when they surveyed psychiatrists, they said 1%. 1% to 2% would go this far. No way. Now, the reason I bring this up is because when the experimenter, the authority, mm -hmm. left the room, mm -hmm. the obedience went way down, like to single digits. And what would happen is the teacher would like lie. Because there's no experimenter, right? There's no one here. He's like calling from the other room on the phone. So he'd be like, move on to the next shock. And he would just like, okay. And he would lie. Because he couldn't stand the shock. So the, the, the point is, having someone like this, there's something to it. There's something, and you know we're in Tulum. Mm -hmm. There's something about energy there's something about eye contact. There's something about seeing like 3D. I don't know what it is exactly. I don't know. Like the exact reason. But there is something to be said about live interaction. And I think everything that you just said brings up two things that it makes me think about. It makes me think about live interaction in terms of authority and in terms of altruism and empathy. And... I think that's that experiment is an excellent indication of how how humans respond when we feel like we have to oblige by authority. And then that's another great question about just education, but all human interaction too is when we have 
when we have to oblige by authority, and I think this is a really good question these days, when we have to oblige by authority, what happens to our empathy? And I think that experiment was an uh, excellent case. Because in the interviews after, they interviewed all these people. And more often than not, they would say, he told me to do it. It's not, it's not my, I mean, it's not my responsibility. Why, why are you, what are you talking about? I wanted, I wanted these, these experiment to go, you know, towards success. So the responsibility was gone. Yes. And this is, and what's even more interesting is that they would, they had like nurses. Wow. Like nurses as, as subject. Cause they, it, it, all sorts of people, yes. like office workers, yeah. and engineers, nurses. And I remember this one nurse who was interviewed. She, she was always talking about like her son who she's taking care of, like her little mm-hmm. son. And, and she kept saying that, you know what? I, I never punish my son. You know, I, I, um, I'm such a good mother. She kept talking about it. Like, you know, my, my son is being taken care of. I love my son so much. I don't believe in punishment. I don't. And I was reading this interviews. I was like, what? She just like, she was one of the she ones. Did who, it. it went all the way to 450 volts. So it's like what we say or even what we believe, Rachel, he, she might believe this 100%, but something happens with authority. When we give away responsibility to someone in a white lab coat. Yes. And it's like, hey, my God. Yes. And this is, this is something that I've realized is that we really, in our education systems, most, most of us have never learned how to how to take care of ourselves and how to have healthy relationships with others and thereby healthy relationships with ourselves. That is everything that we've talked about (laughs) Um, is in my experience and in my experience, that's been just kind of the, the biggest takeaway. And that's, that's why I actually became a coach because I was like, we're teaching all of these facts. We're teaching like the Pythagorean theorem, which now like, which a child, I mean, maybe if you are an architect, right? I don't think that, I think that 99% of of kids that have learned the Pythagorean theorem may not ever use it. (laughs) And we're, we're really, we're, we're heightening the importance of things like that. But we're not heightening the importance of what's in your self-soothing toolbox. How do you self-soothe? How do you how do you learn to deal with stress? How do you how do you how do you talk to a friend who's going through a lot of stress? What habits do you need to do day to day to to take care of yourself so you stay regulated? So you stay regulated, so you stay happy. And and I think that's such a shame that just it, it breaks my heart that we don't teach teach kids or young adults or college students really how to take care of ourselves. And then so, I mean, so what happens? We we grow up, we think that we have to get a really demanding nine to five job. We get burned out, we're miserable. And and we're wondering what the heck? And, and we've seen an exponential rise in depression and anxiety and mental health disorders. And, and so much of it goes back to the purpose of education. And what's the role of being a citizen? Is it to be a, 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 like, um, a member of the assembly line, just doing kind of what you're told until you get burned out? Because I think a lot of, we live in a very interesting place in Tulum where a lot of people say they've come to ex- escape the matrix, right? And um, I, I think when you, when you asked me that question about, public schools versus the in the future direction and private schools so many families are are like I want my kid to learn how to how to play and be happy and work in a team and work on different projects and innovate and create and build and test and fail and learn from failure and boy do I wish that was the direction that most uh, the broader education system were going and it's not it's not until 
you have massive funding and you prioritize public education that will ever happen. And that's a huge ask. That's a really big ask. Um, and so that's why I think realistically looking like in terms of, of government spending for most countries with the exception of um, Scandinavian countries and, and I think select Asian countries right now, uh, people are moving towards just trying to, trying to develop the best private schools that they can and send their kids there. Um, cause sometimes, right. You only can control what's in your locus of control. And sometimes overhauling the entire public education <laughs> system is not in the cards. And so you have to, so you, you do what you can as an individual. And that's a, that's a hard, that's a very hard realization. And that was very, very, very disheartening kind of when I realized just what was in my locus of control. And, um, and so I said, how can I, how can I teach people in a different way to make themselves happy? And that's actually honestly why I left teaching. Wow. So if we look at the student mm -hmm. and, and let's uh, zoom out, mm -hmm. right? Student is responsible a mm -hmm. little bit. How much we can debate. Then there's the teacher. Mm -hmm. Then there is the, maybe the principal or mm -hmm. some, some supervisor then there's the school, the district, so on and so forth, all the way to Earth. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, do you have any? Um, I don't know, like a structure where you would say, this entity is this much responsible. This entity is this much responsible. Because some people would say, quite honestly, you know what? Parents are responsible. Forget about it. Hundred percent. Who who cares? Parents should figure it out. It's your kid. But parents are paying tax yes. for some reason, right? As other people would say, no, the student is responsible. You know, he or, or someone may come from a, some religious background or some spiritual background and say, you know what? This person committed sins in an earlier mm -hmm. life. So they're, you know, there's different perspectives all over the world. Yeah. So for you, who's responsible? You forgot. Um, lobbyists. So I, oh goodness, please don't, uh, please forgive me for forgetting the name of the Supreme Court case, but the Supreme Court case that decided that uh, companies can, can basically be individuals and fund, fund politicians as, as individuals. That, that case has also affected education too. You have companies of any type that are able to push politicians to regulate state curricula in different ways. It also depends, like, so who, who, who makes the standardized tests, right? State governments. So this, at the end of the day, we are all human. That's a blessing and a curse, right? Because as, because being human, right, means that we have flaws. And so one of those flaws is being persuaded by money and power. And so if you have a company coming up to you saying, and I, I'm, I won't get political here, but you can, there are big differences in the different, in curricula in Florida and Texas and, and versus northeastern states like it really does go state to state because some states will say we some state governments will pass laws saying you can't teach this subject evolution for example um uh and then i there's um a big debate right now with like critical race theory and i even heard social emotional learning which was a fascinating one so um lobbyists that dictated the most funding of funding of politicians so that pol so politicians will make decisions in one way or another, and there is more money being those companies are are more lucrative than the um, than the nonprofits trying to work for improved public education. So that's why you see so many differences and so much change and kind of in between states. It is super fascinating. And so that's why I would say 
state government for sure. How did the companies make money exactly? So textbook companies are a huge one. Ah, different and that, editions coming and the out. more, yes, the more you change the textbook, the more those companies have to be, have to be funded. Um, but it's also, when I say company, it can be an individual, right? An individual can also very heavily, um, donate to a politician in favor of, of pushing legislation in one way or another okay. as well. Okay. Um, and, and politicians, their job is to represent constituents. You want to represent a constituent who's keeping you in power, right? Yeah. It's humanity's fascinating, right? That's why you got it. That's I, why you're here. It, yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> That's why I did neuroscience. This is yes. it. Yes. This is the topic. I was yes. like, Hey, cause I, I was, I did my undergrad in, in computer science mm. at, at, at University of Texas at Arlington. And, um, my last, uh, year mm -hmm. I took AI. And this is like before this crazy AI stuff now. So, you know, you have chat GPT yeah. and I was playing with uh, these types of ro robotic chats in, in to 1999. Could you imagine? Like, no yeah. No way. And so I, and then I see all this AI boom. I'm like, man, I was doing this stuff like 25 years ago. This is crazy. <laughs> um, so, uh, so when I took AI, my supervisor, uh, Diane Cook, mm -hmm. uh, she's at uh, Washington now. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a dean there. But she was my honors thesis supervisor, mm -hmm. and she taught us AI. Mm -hmm. And during the class, I was like, hmm, I want to study the human brain, you know? Like, not this machine stuff. This is kind of like neural networks. Like, come on, let's study, like, this stuff. Like, humans and the life and what what's, like, the depth of a human being. And one thing that comes to mind is, how hard is it? to structure a curriculum. Because I know probably when I was in undergrad, I, I, I was thinking about this all the time. I was like, you know, I went, I went through the public education system in Texas, right? And I had like AP classes and all that. I took like all the hard classes, like every AP class I mm -hmm. took it. If, if I'm interested, if I'm not interested, yes. it doesn't matter. I just want some hard stuff to do. And then I, I realized when I was an undergrad, I, all of my friends were like from India yeah. trying to get a, you know, straight A's in, in, in university. And I would hang out with the Indians, right? And they were always looking at me. He's like, you know what, Farhan? We can't believe that you were educated in the American education system because like, like you're good. Like you're like us. You're, you're like getting, you know, high grades like us. Yeah. And, and I was like, yeah, I never thought of that. Like I never thought I had a shitty educator. Like, um, but but then in, in in hindsight, and this especially when I moved to Canada, mm. I realized how brainwashed I was. You know, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Yeah. Right? So so but but then again, when you think, okay, there's this kid, and, and I don't know if you, you remember John Watson. Mm. Uh what uh, John Watson is one of the premier psychologists from like mm -hmm. more than a hundred years ago. And his theory was Give me a group of babies who are just born and tell me exactly what you want me to make each of them and I will fucking do it. That's Watson's claim. Now, if we see that in the education system, as we go from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we're learning, right? Like I remember one time my uh, cousin Danish in uh, Texas, he came home one day, he's like, uh, mama, mama is my mom. We, they call her mama. It's like mama. We and I was listening. I was in the room. She's like, uh, uh, I was in school today, and we had a, a discussion on religion, and um, the topic of Islam came up, and our teacher goes, "Oh, next we're gonna discuss uh, Islam. You know those terrorists, them." And Danish is like, like he got up, like he's like, no, that's not true. Right, And the teacher made him leave the, the room, leave the class. Like, hey, you're disturbing the class, leave. And he came home like literally almost crying. Of course. Now, others don't have the luxury of, hey, wait, let me take a step back. What the hell is going on here? Because for me, analytical skills, blah, 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 it's all awesome, right? It's like training the brain and, and the ability to ask questions. But a big part of education is self-awareness. Right? Like, what do I believe? There's a saying, 
I think I heard it in uh, one of the podcasts. Don't always believe what you think. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So that, taking a step back, what does Farhan believe? Like, why does Farhan believe this? Who told you this? That thing, maybe call it an inner voice. Maybe mo- some people don't have it. There's no inner voice. So, is can you envision a utopia oh. <laughs> where, where there is a structured curriculum? My God, this this would be so complex. It's mind boggling. I know. I like, our brains are thinking the same like, thing. Like, why <laughs> would you teach someone the Pythagorean theorem, and why would you not teach them the Pythagorean theorem? Right? Why would you teach someone calculus or not yes. teach them calculus? Yes. Yep. So there's. There's currently uh, education, right? You, we, we put kids in grades based on age. Utopia, right? What if it's not based on... So in this utopia, um, we are... Kids come in and you have to always assess kids to see where they're at. First, we would be doing a better job at that. We would be seeing, okay, like, like how socially, emotionally regulated are you? How much trauma do you have? Is there more work to be done in... Um, in in social emotional learning, and because of standardized tests, that is the like one of the first things to be cut out in public school lessons is the time we take to have heart to heart conversations about hard stuff going on in the world or what the community may be going on with. So we'd be assessing for trauma trauma needs. Um, we'd be assessing for prior knowledge, right? We'd be assessing for problem solving. We'd be assessing for um, interpersonal skills right and and maybe we'd be assessing for interests too and so then when you have all of those things utopian schools and a lot of schools are moving towards this is called a project-based learning model and they're going in an intra wait sorry interdisciplinary method so that means that this is utopia right um you have your team of teachers, your high school teachers. You've got your math teacher, science teacher, history teacher, uh, language teacher. Um, uh, what else am I missing? Like, yeah, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. So, so let's say let's say you have your your math math science language arts history. Your four quote unquote main subjects: arts, right? Uh, physical education. Some some others too. Maybe computer science. Let's say they have they are assigned a group of kids that have all varying levels of these things and maybe they're in an age range too they're not all 12 and 13 maybe they're between 11 and 15 or something like that and it's and in a project-based learning model in this utopia it would be let's create a project where these kids are solving a real problem let's take Tulum let's say it's we want to decrease trash on the street how can We create a project around this. Maybe it's first up. And so what would the outcome be? What are the skills that we want these kids to learn? We want, let's say we want these kids to learn how to work on a team. We want to teach, we want them to learn about ecology, about recycling. Maybe it's a chemistry lesson thrown there about metals, right? Um, History, it's history of the, of the area. How about people, how people in the past used to take care of it? Um, you have a little geography in there. What's what's the basis of this soil? Um, arg- and then for argument writing, what's the outcome? How What's the project? Is it a campaign? Is it articles in the newspaper? Is it is it flyers? That's the art part too, right? And so you have argumentative writing. You might have research being done in there too. For math, maybe they develop a recycling system. Maybe you're teaching percents about what percent um, will go, will, what percent if we recycle this number of percent, maybe it's a coin return system. Could this be a business that the kids start? That could have Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. Shortest. There we go. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's utopia. Utopia is happening at some schools. At, at, again, Montessori schools are some of the best examples of this, but there are other schools where this type of learning is happening. That's what King's Academy was moving towards. And another utopian Think about how we sit in the classroom. How did you sit in the classroom when you were growing up in like elementary school, middle school? What did it look like? Uh, desk, 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 desk. Maybe 25 to 30. 
Mm-hmm. And one person per desk, like shitty chairs, blackboard, yep. teacher explaining. So you're all facing the teacher. Yes. Yes. Not ourselves. Not yourselves. No. So another technique I learned at, at King's Academy was the Harkness method. They took out all the desks in the rooms and replaced them with circ- oval tables. Massive oval tables. Hard wood. And so it kind so of- So one table. One table. Like a semi-Socratic seminar. No. It- uh, it was the whole thing was a circle. Oh. So you weren't all looking at a teacher. You were looking at each other God, in a so, boardroom, so right, right. almost okay. like. And so kids would pull up with their, with their um, again, private school. So each kid had a laptop, of course. <laughs> um, and, and we would have discussions. And m- one thing I learned in my teacher training at that school was how to facilitate a debate. Kind of how to encourage, how to prompt kids and ask them, do you agree, disagree? Why, why not? And this helped so much to develop as you were just talking about. What do I believe and why? Because that's critical thinking. And and in this hyper-changing world that we live in, what should we believe and why? And we need to make those, and I think, I think we are bombarded with so many different ideas, just scrolling through Instagram or TikTok or something like that, that so many times, especially young, younger, undeveloped minds take things in without thinking. And so I loved having those conversations. I loved teaching kids in that way because it asking them at simply asking why is such, is such a sign of respect. It asks the person to communicate what's important to them. And and you learn so much about someone's perspective on the world and their own personal experiences too. Just from asking why. I think asking why is the most one of the most important questions you can you can always ask. Um, And so that that is utopia. Um, And I think project selection, going back to this, is highly important too. Kids have, uh, we have seen increasing problems with students learning these days just because content isn't being delivered in a, in a um, interesting manner, right? It's, it's textbooks. It's, um, and a lot of times textbooks are out of date. And so you're not talking about real world issues. So it's like, let's solve a real world problem actually in front of us. That's interesting. Let's solve something that affects you and me day to day that we can make our lives easier. That's interesting. And so I actually have just been sending my former, my former colleagues AI tools. I was like, stop what you're doing. I know you're working in inner city Philadelphia public school, like principals riding you to finish the math curricula by this date. But if I were you, I would have the kids create a business. I would have every kid create a business right now. My, my TikTok and my Instagram are taken up by chat GPT tricks or look at this new site for AI. You can teach, if we can, especially, especially in um, difficult socioeconomic areas, teach a man to fish, right? If we can teach kids how to use these tools responsibly, it's a huge fallacy of education right now is, a, is fighting these things off. Um, if we can teach these kids how to use these things properly to better their lives, their families' lives, and teach them lifelong skills for a technology that is definitely here to stay instead of just pushing it off, goodness gracious, the impact that you can make too. But the problem with that is that takes a radical pivot, right, in curricula. So what I told my friends is usually what happens is after um, state Statewide testing usually takes p- place in the spring before the school year is over, as late as, you can, as a state can get it, right? Because it covers the material they should have learned the past year. So usually, because different uh, districts end at different time, usually tests, at least in Philly, took place in like March, April. So then teachers relax because you have this, because you're, 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 not, about, you're not bound to the deadline of the test anymore. So usually what happens is the projects the teacher has wanted to do forever anyway. Sometimes teaching is so hard that you're burned out by the end of the year. And so they'll just do whatever they've done the same year after same year. 
that would be my project for teachers if if I had if right after tests is have them build a business using AI. And then uh, similarly too, I I I if anyone's a teacher who, who's who's listening and you're like, but you're like, but my kids are using it to do their math homework. Okay. Ask them to explain how they use the AI. One thing that we can do is to get kids better at prompting. And if we, we getting them better at, pr- at prompting and having them explain processes, explaining a process is, diff- is a difficult thing. If a kid use honestly, if a kid used their ho- used AI to do their homework and had like a brilliant process by having and doing it, and hopefully maybe learn something along the way, that would be awesome. <laughs> I think that'd be super cool, right? But the problem is, is that the outcome of lessons. Mm-hmm and curricula goals is too simplistic. It's rote memorization. It's not skill-based as much. So that, that brings into question, what's, what's the end goal of some of these? And there are, and the beautiful thing is that different districts have different heads of curricula who do get to make decisions. And some heads of curricula are more adapted than others, depending on your department too. Like I remember I loved working in the science department in Philly because that head of, of, uh, of, of curricula, um, Katie Dav- Davenport, if you're listening, <laughs> um, she, she was so innovative and I, and I, and the, she encouraged us towards project-based learning, which was really hard in that massive system. So props to her. Wow. So you said some schools are trying to push these tools away. And I can imagine that it's probably because it will make them futile, right? The, the school system becomes futile if these things work. Okay, fair enough. But then, this is my uh, this is my debate with things like ChatGPT. Okay, us as a human species, we are not going inner enough. I, I honestly believe this because if we are always reaching externally for answers, right? Like, for example, if you have some immense depression, which we all do, we ha- all have trauma, childhood trauma, this trauma, every, every, everybody has it, including myself. How can AI and things like ChatGPT help us with the self-awareness because I don't know, I tend, I come from a sort of notion that everything I have inside of me already, right? Yes. So rather than taking a shortcut, quote unquote, how can I just reach the answer inside, yes. right? Yeah. And yes, these things are here to stay. But then again, I would push back on the fact that a lot of technology, is used by the general public, but not necessarily by the people who make it, right? So you look at something like iPad, Jobs didn't allow his kids to use it, right? And a lot of, uh, I learned all this from the book Neurotribes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a book about autism and uh, spectrum disorder. And they, the guy basically said is that, you know, he went on this cruise ship with a bunch of entrepreneurs, uh, high-tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and he would interview each of them. And he's like, wait, a lot of their kids are autistic, but so are they, right? So he was uncovering like the genetic basis of autism, but he also realized that a lot of these entrepreneurs, they are not doing the technology addiction that they that's promulgating to the masses, right? Like the, the person who is, making the product, right? Don't get high on your own supply type of thing. So if we look at the basis or the purpose of ChatGPT or the purpose of AI, what is, like, why would somebody do it? And I'm from the notion that I don't think it's for philanthropy or like, let's do good for the world necessarily. There's some other stuff out there, right? Because my team, they're all using ChatGPT. Right, they're using it to write copy and uh, VSLs and ads and all this stuff, right? And chat, chat bots. And I'm like, wait, 
for me personally, and this is just my personal bias, it's like, I have it inside me. Like, I have 14 billion years of evolution in me, mm -hmm. right? And some dude made ChatGPT. It's some code, right? So, I don't know. Maybe it's more of a conservative, traditional route, old-fashioned route. But I don't necessarily see the hype. Yeah. And it's so interesting. And I think what you are, I think what you said is completely right. I think that we have everything inside of us already. And AI will never be able to take away that human spark, as we've been talking about this whole time, that, that feeling you get when someone is truly listening to you, when another human being is listening to you, when you share a commonality with another human being and you have that, that little joy, that, that little endorphin boost, right? Chat. AI will never be able to take away community and humans need community to survive. So knowing that, and that's the, that's the most fascinating thing. I was just reading a paper about which jobs AI is probably going to, to eliminate first. And it's ones that I was surprised by. It's, it's mathematicians, lawyers, engineers, doctors, um, tax accountants, what jobs are safe? Bricklayers, <laughs> plumbers, hands-on jobs. Um, and yes, there is even an uptick and I think like almost like supportive bots in terms of mental health, but I'm very, excuse me, I'm very open with my, my own mental health struggles. I started doing ice baths to, as a, and they really, really have helped me in my own mental health journey, but uh, sure, you could talk to a, a bot therapist, right? But for me, that's not going to cut it. Human empathy is irreplaceable, in my opinion. Um, and that's something beautiful is that that comes with imperfection, right? That comes with imperfection. It comes with experience and ancestry and history and, and context. And, um, and I think that's that's reassuring, right? That the humanity can never take away our, our inner light. Um, but as a frequent user of ChatGPT, <laughs> so why, why do I love, why do I like it? So yes, I do have everything in me. I, I could write emails. I could, I could write more copy. And I like to, but for me, especially right now I'm, I'm launching another company. I have so many things to do. So what I like to use ChatGPT for is my um, writer's block undoer. So it all, I like to use it to get started. However, have I ever used the finished, pro have I ever used an output that ChatGPT has given me as a final product? Absolutely no. Why? Doesn't sound like me. <laughs> Doesn't sound like me at all. Um, it's often wrong. Like it's wrong, it's often wrong, but it's brilliant, brilliant for helping in areas that you, that you lack knowledge in or, um, or you, you're having a lot of, lot of time with output. So for example, um, it can generate six months of Instagram content for you. Like you can prompt it to do that ideas. Then you like, give me six months of ideas, then give me a schedule about how to lay that out. And so for the small business entrepreneur who doesn't have a team behind you, you, you now have a free tool to do the work of five people. And so I, that's why I believe in this so much for any, anyone who likes creating, because sure, you might not know taxes, you might not know accounting, you might not know how to code or something like that, but this is a tool. This is like a, literally a personal assistant that can get you started on everything. So for me, another cool way I've been using it, I, I'm not an, a Microsoft Excel master, but in, in developing my algorithm right now for, for CycleSync training, um, I've been asking it, hey, can you, like, I need this cell to do this. What's a formula for that? Because I'm looking on Google and I can't, in the, the, the support forums, I'm like, this isn't right, it's not working. And so I was on ChatGPT probably for like 20 hours last week, going back and forth with it, helping me 
to make formulas that worked until I had, and they were like, they were if um, conditional logic formulas. So they're like a hundred words long for, for one cell to get this right. I didn't have to hire a single person. I was able to do it myself. And it was fun because I was testing things out and then I was reprompting it being like, this didn't work about it, but I see in the code that I think this part is right. So can you only tailor this part? So you have to know a little bit, but it allows you to do things only knowing a little bit. It allows you to do more things. I've asked it about um, starting a business, about what's my estimated tax burden, states of starting an LLC. Explain to me trusts and, um, and uh, holding companies and information that I didn't grow up learning around the dinner table that as an entrepreneur, I'm going to need to know. And yes, there's so many books out there, but sometimes like I have a stack of books and it's that book that I need to read there is, is here at the bottom of the stack, but I need that now at the top of the stack. Um, for, oh, goodness, the list is, it's, it's incredible. You can really ask it anything. And, and in any language too, any language. And so I, I see it as just greater access to resources for everybody. I see it as a tool of, of equity. However, with, with power comes responsibility, exactly as you said. And so you know how I said I never use it as the finished product? And I said, you still need to know a little. ChatGPT delivers a robot, a robotic product. I feel it is every person's responsibility, if you want to do a good job with it, to rehumanize that final product, whether it's e an, an email newsletter. It's not going to say, it will, none of mine sounded right. I had, they were a good base, but I always had to tailor them up a little bit. Um, and so I think it's fascinating. And I think there's a huge question and what, what is responsible use for AI right now? And there's so many beautiful, very valid opinions on it. And, um, it's, it's hard because I think in schools, in education, right? We, we do want to learn fundamental things. So that way everyone, you know the little. You at least know the little. So that way you can figure out what you really like. What, what are you interested as a kid? If you're learning using ChatGPT to use all your math homework, you might never realize you like math. You might never realize you like developing video game code and making your own video game one day. So that's a very hard challenge for educators and parents right now. Man, it's gonna be fun. It's so fun. <laughs> the, the unknown. The oh unknown. Yes. I know my dad, he always talked about this thing called Google Classroom or something. Oh my goodness. And uh, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I just have to figure this out and have the kids be busy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, I lived on Google Classroom. I, you're, you're like bringing back like the keywords, the key phrases. That's so, oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> you said something about um, ice math, right? Yes. The depression and yeah. Take, yeah, because that's how I know you, yes. right? The ice bath, <laughs> the, the girl with the ice bath, you know, the ice bath queen. Um, so take me through the journey of what happened, how you encountered cold exposure, why did that happen? The, the idea for, you know, making a community out of it and here in Tulum and elsewhere. And, and uh, you know, you make content all the time. I see you at Jungle Gym making content. <laughs> so where does all this What's the motivation and where do you want, what do you want the world to know about ice baths? Oh, I'm, I'm, thank you for giving me this opportunity, seriously. So let me, let me start just by saying cold exposure period, ice baths, cold shower, jumping in, a, jumping in a freezing lake. Um, if you are, if you are lucky enough to live in that cold of an environment, that is a source of controlled good stress is what I like to say. And we live in a world of excessive, uncontrolled stress. <laughs> and so just an umbrella way, like I love to think about it, is you are able to practice handling stress. So that way you change your general response to stress outside of the ice. And I have never, I've never felt, found a tool like that, that just teaches me over and over and over. Um, and so how did I, how did I find that? So I, I am from Boston, Massachusetts, right? It's 
when I was growing up, it got a lot of snow. Now, now not so much, but still pretty cold. And I, I remember I did one polar plunge in high school and I was like, oh my gosh, this is horrific. And I generally despise being cold. <laughs> I despise it. I come to Tulum and I'm at uh, a, a day party at, at Panamera and um, I, 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 I had just moved to Tulum, so I'm just talking to everyone I can and, and just trying to meet, make new friends. And I meet Jeff Dobney. And Jeff has lived in Tulum for 14 years, and he is known for doing his ice baths around here, I learned. And I'm asking him, like, what the heck? Why? Why would you do that? I don't like being cold. And he's like, just, just come try it out. So I roll up to his house, and he, he has this plastic inflatable tub filled with ice in front on the sidewalk in Tulum and there's a bunch of people standing around and they're all getting in it joyfully <laughs> and I said okay that looks hard and fortunately unfortunately I have a very competitive side um and so I said I want to be able to do that and I want to be able to do it well and so I remember getting in my first time and and Jeff coached me through the breathing technique and what I have since since learned and I like to communicate is your body doesn't know the difference between getting chased by a tiger and the ice. And when you're getting chased by a tiger, your breath is going, <gasps> right? You're hyperventilating. There's a lot of emphasis on the inhale and it's very shallow. It's right up here in your chest. Well, that is when we are hyper stressed. So in order to evoke the opposite response, we need to do the opposite breathing. We have to focus on our exhales and we have to have nice long exhales. That tricks our heart rate into slowing down and that tricks our mind to say, ah, I'm, I'm safe. So I, I get in that first ice bath. Jeff teaches me that technique and I actually lasted six minutes, my first ice bath. Um, and I was euphoric. I was absolutely euphoric. And then so I started ice bathing like every time Jeff would, would throw into the group, hey, I'm having ice baths at this day. So I was ice bathing like like three to five times a week for August and September. And, and then in October, I'm at an event and I just, a woman was having difficulty and I just kind of like went over to her and started talk, talking to her. And I was like, like just long exhales, like big in through your nose, long exhale through your mouth. And, and Jeff came over and he was like, we should talk. So Jeff, um, Jeff has taught a lot of people how to how to coach ice bathing. And, and he was like, I would love I would love if we could work together, too. So I said, absolutely. Like, I'm still growing my community here in Tulum. And so I'm I'm so grateful for Jeff. And he, he introduced me to um, his his partner, Janice. And um, I've learned so much from the two of them about ice bathing and, and, and coaching and and life. Right. Because. Yes, ice baths are great for the following. They're great for decreasing inflammation. They're great for reducing chronic pain. Um, things like lower anything from lower back pain to, to arthritis, fibromyalgia, gout. I'm looking more into menstrual cycle applications like PMS periods, um, menopause, and then mental, right? We have a huge dopamine response. Um, we're seeing how much it helps depression and anxiety. Um, it, it really helps people sometimes with sleep too, your melatonin, your circadian rhythms. And then it, it, therefore in general, like it helps people just level up. So I, I've loved meeting different people and learning why they want to get into the ice. And it's not about as much your physical, how your physical body is. What determines how, how well you, or not well you do in the ice is how's your mind. I think you'll appreciate this. I find that people more in tune with themselves do better. And I have like a host of characters that I <laughs> that I have to film at some point about like who gets in the ice because you have some people that are like, like, hey, babe, like check this out. They'll like get in and the guy will be like, my balls are freezing off or something like that. And then you have like the a bachelorette party girl that's like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. Um, and so sometimes if people obviously are doing it for show, it's really hard. It's really hard. But when someone comes up and they're like, I'm, I'm trying to... Um, I had a really hard, either A, I'm, I had a really hard workout, like I'm, I'm really, really sore, or I'm, I'm trying to learn how to love myself more. I want to learn to trust myself more is one I've heard. I want to, I want to learn to overcome fear. I've heard some very 
beautiful things that people are trying to improve amongst themselves. And that's what we focus on. So like the first 45 to 60 seconds, you are hyper-focusing on that breathing. And then your heart rate slows down. And the most important phrase I think I have taken away from ice bathing, you are safe. You are safe. That phrase can cure so many things in this world. <laughs> and there's so much research behind the, the mind, I mean, the, the mind and, and the narrative that we present ourselves with and then our physiological response to, right? The ice has taught me and teaches other people that you are safe in your own body no matter what context is going on. And boy, does that alternate your stress response. So for me, as I was ice bathing that frequently, and when I, it was kind of right when I started coaching, I realized I feel really good. I feel really good. Um, I'm enjoying meeting all these people, and I had been on four mental health medications when I got here in August. Um, I have had a, I've had a very long, um, very long uh, relationship, right, with, with anxiety and, and depression. And I'm, I am super grateful for those medicines. Like they, they got me to be here sitting in front of you today. And I think medication has a role in, in people's lives. But for me, logistically, it was a little getting a little hard to get my medicine, meds in Mexico. <laughs> um, and also I was feeling really good. And so I said, I asked my doctor, I was like, can I get off of my second antidepressant? And so that's the first one I got out of was my second anti antidepressant. It was Wellbutrin. And then I said, I'm sleeping a little bit better. Can I get off the trazodone? And we weaned off trazodone. And then I was focusing a lot better too. So I was like, can I get off of Ritalin? And she was like, yeah, we can get off Ritalin. And the hardest one was Citalopram, Celexa, at the very end. Because Celexa and I have had the longest relationship together. And I, again, I am not anti-medicine. I'm so grateful for, for what those medicines have, for those medicines for allowing me to put one foot in front of the other to, to, to focus on healing, right? And so when I finally tapered off of Celexa, it was a whole new world. It was a whole new world. But that changed my brain chemistry, obviously, right? So... Our brains are, and I, 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 I love that um, you studied neuroscience, right? Because just how the plasticity of the brain. So even though I got off of medication, I got on to ice baths. So my brain <laughs> is now dependent upon an ice bath every single day. And the cool thing, though, is that I liked, I, I prefer doing it this way, even though it's like 10 more minutes of my day, right? Why? So the stress response in the ice bath, right? It, for, for kind of a hyperactive, uh, busy brain person like me, and many people are, are like that, it's a, a stimulus that forces you to have to focus, right? So for me, I get my best meditation done in an ice bath. You're, you're, you have no other option. You, you are in like breathing prison. <laughs> So you have to hyper-focus on your breath. So I have far more effective meditations in there. Um, I also like to do it before my workout too. So that way I come into my workout with almost no inflammation. Um, I, it, it's a huge dopamine boost, right? Your dopamine is your readiness hormone. So I, it's like pre-workout. So I come in and I am super hyped up. And then in terms of, of my cycle too, it's helped with cramps in my experience. I've, I, I collect a lot of anecdotal notes from women. So it's helped people sleep. Um, one thing I will say is throughout the menstrual cycle, we have noticed that um, out, uh, exercise outcome seems to be more dependent on uh, psychological changes throughout the menstrual cycle, which are related to hormone fluctuations. So... If you have a tool like an ice bath, even if, if you're an elite athlete and you have a training session, but you know your period's about to come in three days, meditate in an ice bath and you will have a way better workout than if you didn't. So the cool thing is that it's cold water. 
And if you don't have an ice bath, you can do it in a cold shower. And the way that I suggest people start is you take your normal shower and the rule of thumb is you end on cold. So maybe you end with 30 seconds of cold and then maybe you're building it up by five seconds every day until you're until maybe you're you just become one of those like hard headed people and and your own entire shower <laughs> ends up being cold or it's just intentional time for you to focus on yourself. And I think that's so important. As you said, we don't take enough time to look inward. And if so, the things that I want people to know are the ice teaches you that you are safe and that allows you to remember in so many other stressful contexts and in, in the world. Um, it allows you to therefore self soothe more effectively, which allows you to make better decisions, have healthier relationships too, usually, um, better sleep. And then the, like if you don't have access to ice, cold showers are a really, really great option. And if you need to take time to look inwards, that, that will illuminate an awful, awful, awful lot. <laughs> Pain, because sometimes different aches and pains will come up, right? Or different emotions. About one in 10 people cry, just burst into tears when they get in the ice bath, in my experience. It's because it leaves you vulnerable. And, and self-talk when we're vulnerable, that, teaching people that and improving every day a little bit on that, that is how you become a better human being to yourself and therefore to others. How do you respond when you're vulnerable? When no one's looking, if you're in an ice bath alone, it's, it's, it's powerful stuff, powerful stuff. So that's why I, I, I love coaching ice baths. I absolutely love it. I'm so grateful every time someone new gets in the ice for me to uh, give me permission to show them what, what they can do in it and what they can overcome and how strong they are because no one has ever gotten out of an ice bath, not being proud of themselves. And I think that's what health and wellness is. That's the only thing it should be about helping us do things that make us proud of ourselves. I can sense the enthusiasm. I, I love talking it's about so this. Cool. I think I hit the mic too. <laughs> I, no, it's okay. It's, hit whatever you want. Uh, Rachel, I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but can you take us into, because um, sometimes I know uh, from the trauma stuff I've read, once you're away from the trauma for, they say about a year and a half, mm -hmm. it's safe to go and... Mm -hmm relive it think mm -hmm. about it and, and I, i'm doing trauma work every single day yeah, you know, yeah i think about certain things i write about past events you know how i can forgive myself forgive other people all the time i'm doing yeah. this like a, a big practice of mine um if you can talk a little bit about that and uh just the power of vulnerability and 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 just take us through what has you know if you're okay to share it yeah. what happened and um just those that story of what led you to taking those four medications and how was therapy and how oh, that helped yes. you and yeah and i'm 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 an open book just because i think i think the more that we all share and and this does not everyone agrees with me on this and that's totally okay but i always think that the more we share the more that we um that people see what see the hard things that we all have in common and we see what strategies have worked for someone or have not worked for someone we might be able, if I can save any one time or inspire someone to, to, to get through something um, that they didn't think they could, one person, that's, that's all that matters to me. So of course, yes, absolutely. So um, when I was a teenager in high school, so, um, so first of all, I guess let's, let's even back up. Let's, all, all the things that I'm working through right now are, um, kind of fear of rejection, which I think we all have, we all deal with that a little bit. Um, and then, and then fear of loss too. So fear of rejection, I think a lot of people can empathize with this one. I, 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 I was bullied growing up. I was um, one of four Asian kids in a white town and my parents tried really, really hard to protect me from that. Um, and I'm so grateful for them. I didn't, I didn't, 
understand how beautiful it was to have Chinese heritage in me until I was until like late college. I I just felt like such an outsider for for so long. And I think um in numerous ways that's why dealing with like still every day how to cope with fear of rejection and remembering you belong and are worthy and that's why my motto is to everyone is like you are worthy as you are in this context no matter what. So that's 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 one go underlying one going all the way back to childhood. Um, but then the second fear of loss. Um, so when I when I was a senior high, in high school, um, I six days after we graduated high school, um, I lost um, my my boyfriend to a car accident that I witnessed, and um, that was. That was, that was the hardest thing um, I've ever gone through still. And so I developed a, um, it was hard because it was senior year of high school. I, I was supposed to go off to college, right? <laughs> and go start anew. And so I, I actually put off the trauma of that loss for a really long time. And I tried, I was in therapy. Um, I had been in, in, I had been in therapy growing up a little bit because I was a very argumentative child. <laughs> Shocking. Um, and so I put off, I was in therapy, but, um, and I thought I was, I thought I was handling it, right? I thought I was working through what I needed to do. And in, in this particular situation, um, uh, Sean, he, he had this big football player guy. He was his nicest, nicest, nicest friend our, our friend group had. And we're all so lucky to have known him. He, um, he, we were walking back from a high school graduation party and he stood on the back of a car that our friend had just pulled up and was like, Hey, let me take you like 10 more feet down. And so I get in the back and I'm like, you should, you should get in the back into the car. And he's like, no, I'm just going to ride. And and he was a huge jokester. Like he used to stay on the back of our cards and like bounce them all the time. And so he, um, he, we, the car was going very, very slow, but when the car took a turn, he, he fell off and, um, and he, we, um, we ended up having to obviously call 911 and, and it was, it was horrific. I witnessed the whole thing and I, um, I had like, and we were all so lucky to know him and, and for, 17, 18 year olds to in the blink of an eye going off to college thinking that was what a celebratory summer it was. It, it, um, it, it was such a loss. And cause he was such a wonderful, wonderful human being. And, um, and that was a very, 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 very quick lesson in how, e how easily good things can, can leave your life and the harshness <laughs> of the human experience. And so I I had a lot of guilt too, because I was like, why didn't I tell you to get in the car? Why didn't I tell you to get in the car? And I think um, to this day, that's something I still, I still, um, I still struggle with is releasing myself of responsibility for like everything. <laughs> so um, after, so I was in therapy and then, <sighs> I, I was partying a lot in college. I was trying to fit in I because I had, had struggled to fit in so much. And um, I, around my junior year, my my body and my brain just kind of couldn't handle it anymore. And I developed a really, really, really severe depression. Um, I couldn't get out of bed. My, I, I, it was, it was really bad. I also developed like binge eating disorder too. I was like eating away the feelings and it was just, I gained like 30 pounds in three months or something like that. And I'm five foot two. So that, that was shocking. I, I was confused. I was like, I thought I dealt with this. <laughs> um, but clearly I had so, 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 so much more to do. And so that's, that was the most intense part of my mental health struggles, definitely. And um, so that's when I started going on Citalopram and, and goodness gracious, community is so important. 
Community is so important. I I would not be standing here today in front of you if it weren't for my best friend in college, Teddy, and and my mom and all of my friends and family members who who just told me I could do it and told me um, to keep putting one foot in front of the other and how beautiful life was and and just encouraging me to remember my self worth too and life takes a village, man. <laughs> like it, it really does. And, and I, and we need to remember that with, uh, with increasing technology. So with that community, I, I, I finished my junior year. I, um, met a, like Citalopram and I, we go back <laughs> that allowed me to feel good enough to study abroad. It allowed me, I mean, I graduated on time, like I graduated on time with honors with the bio minor. Um, and, and then when I went to, I think that was also a big, a big wake up call of what's this world about? What's this human experience about? Um, what more to life is there? Why is this life so special? Why is, why is, why is life worth living? And that's what encouraged me to go to Jordan and to travel from Jordan to as many different countries as I could, to meet as many different people as I could, to learn just about humanity um, and what makes every single person special. Because I think, I mean, the, again, the human experience is hard. Like, like some people, some a lot of people, there are plenty of people that didn't haven't made it to as old as I am today. And so I think, I think another question is, I was like, okay, so one, why me? Why me? <laughs> what's the special thing in me? And so what's also the special thing in you, in you, in you, in you, in you? And I, I, I love getting to know that about people. I love learning about people's spark, and, and, and the the, the instant thing that you that you pick up on when you meet someone new that you're like, oh yeah, you seem cool. Like I, like you're fascinating. I, I would love to learn more about you. I'm so passionate about about meeting new people. Some people call me like a human golden retriever. Um, and I could not, there's no greater compliment than that, <laughs> but I think that, that, um, that desire and based on my experiences got me, um, a traveling around the Middle East for a while and then back to Philly kind of. And, and that made me wonder a lot given my, again, my experience with my mental health, like, okay, we're not teaching kids to take care of each other, take care of themselves. We're not taking humans, teaching humans to be mentally healthy in schools. That's a crime. <laughs> That's a huge crime. That's the first thing. So like social emotional health is being, is like the first thing that's cut out in so many classrooms. Cause, it, cause there are conversations that aren't written in the curriculum. There are plenty of nonprofits that will come in and teach kids that. But um, so that was the biggest wake up call in Philly. And um, I was still on medication then. And um, that's when I started to exercise a lot more. So I had been a track runner in high school. I ran half marathons in college. And then in Philly, I ran the Philly Marathon. But I also, um, I, I had been, I have been engaged. So I had a, I, in my old engagement too, I, I was like, I want to get in shape for this wedding. <laughs> so that's when I started CrossFit. I tried, started functional fitness classes. I tried every app. I tried every diet app and none of them worked. None of them worked. I would get sick of them so quickly because I, I'm a, I, I'm a high stimulus person. I need, I need something to be very interesting for me. And then I developed, I, I found like pure lifting, like just pure and I think there's something in the in now that I'm thinking about it in this moment right now that I hadn't realized before, <laughs> like something about just the simplicity of a, a lifting moment motion that aligns to also why I loved track and field too. It's like one foot in front of the other, and with lifting too, it's just one you're pulling up or you're or you're pushing. That's it. It's a, it's one thing to focus on to do doing well in that moment, and I love. I just, I fell in love with just lifting barbells, heavy weight, heavy weight lifting that made me feel so strong and so capable. And like I said earlier, do some one thing a day that makes you feel proud of yourself. Every lift, I was like, I'm proud of you. <laughs> and you just, you just come out and you're like, cool, since I can do this, I can also do that. And 
then I started eating to fuel my body. Like I wasn't trying to lose weight. I was trying to, I wanted to be stronger. And so ever since I've focused on being as strong and capable as I can, then aesthetics came after. And goodness, how much that's helped my mental health. And so that's, that's why in my coaching and my app that I'm launching, like that's my philosophy. I want every woman, because I'm more woman scared, but any, I want everyone I come in contact, contact to <laughs> with to, I would, my main look, mission in life is to help people feel like their strongest, most confident selves. And if I can do, if I can help one person, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, Rachel, thank you for being so vulnerable. First of, of all, you're, uh, going into that story and telling us the details is, is, uh, is a difficult thing. And you touched on community and, and I want to get into this a little bit because I've been having an interesting idea lately and I want to get your thoughts on yeah. it. Uh, but before that, just the concept of depression. So when we were in the living room, we were talking about Abraham Maslow mm -hmm. and uh, his supervisor was Harry Harlow. Mm -hmm. And Harry at the University of Wisconsin did experiments where he wanted to replicate depression in a rhesus macaque monkey, right? Mm. How can we rep? Because his point was, well, he wants to solve the, the pain, right? He wants to solve the depression. And obviously there was no Wel Wel Welbutrin and the yeah. uh, other pills at the time. Um, so he wanted to do it from a behavioral perspective, mm -hmm. right? But the problem was, how do you how do you instill chronic depression in a mm. monkey? That's, that's hard, right? So he tried everything, right? He did a lot of isolation experiments. He would leave monkey yeah. alone for three months, for six months, for a year. Then he would reintroduce them. And there was some horror stories, right? There was a lot of the monkeys were doing the rocking behavior, like autistic uh, patients. Yeah. Um, a lot of them were eating you know, their own hand. They were doing very self-mutilating um, actions, but he wasn't happy. He's like, nah, this is not really depression. Because the hallmark of depression is what you touched on is learned helplessness, right? When you're in bed, and I thank God that I haven't, uh, you know, thank God that I haven't suffered from a certain, this type of traumatic event where I couldn't like get out of bed. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that why this can happen to anyone. So what he would do is he would say, okay, what can we do to this monkey which would train him to be helpless, like give up on life? So he devised what he called the pit of despair. He wanted to call it the dungeon of despair, but you know, uh, people were like, hey, man, towed it down a little bit. He could have called it like a vertical chamber, but he wanted to get uh, reactions from people. He was very like a controversial figure. So he said, okay, I made this pit of despair. It's literally a vertical chamber which a monkey can sit in, right? Like a three-month-old young baby monkey. And on the top was a wire mesh to cover the, the chamber. As the monkey climbed up, he tried to get out because he wanted to see his family and other... He couldn't, came back down. Climbed up, couldn't, came back down. And the monkey kept doing that for days. Mm. But on the fourth or fifth day, he gave up and he just sat there crouched up in the in the bottom of the vertical chamber he's like okay fair enough this monkey is like uh, already isolated and kind of like already depressed a little bit let me take a happy monkey and do the same thing right so he took a happy monkey who had you know wonderful parents and even in the macaques that there's a there are parents that beat the child wow. for no reason, just like human stuff, right? And they found, they've done studies where they studied uh, the children macaques as they were playing and they wanted to know when would the monkey come back home to sleep. And the ones whose parents beat him, he would always come home late after the parents had gone to sleep. Like crazy shit like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's a pit of despair this happens. And he's like, okay, let's take a happy monkey and do the same thing. You know, monkeys, you know, he's already uh, in, in an adolescent. Uh, he's very happy. He's healthy. He's, you know, his parents love him. Let's put him in the pit of despair. Four days. 
he's helpless. He gives up, right? And if you, I don't know if you've read Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl. Oh, it's, I've gotten through just the first part of it, yeah. Wonderful book. And, uh, you know, the, I don't want to spoil the, <laughs> the ending. But, but basically the gist of the book is if you have meaning in life, you will survive. Yes. And without meaning, you're going to complain and bitch. And But the thing is, Rachel, in your life, you were celebrating graduation, about to go to college, start your, and you were put in the pit of despair, right? Now, the question about community is that what aspect of community is most important, okay? Because I grew up in a community. I mean, we had a, you know, I belonged to a very small group within Islam, uh, which is known as Ismailism. We're known as the Ismailis. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have like a, a, you know, prayer hall and mm -hmm. we, we do like dancing together. It's a, it's a beautiful community, mm -hmm. right? It's like the, the, we're known as like the Jews of Islam, right? Because it's very, very tight knit. And uh, although the community was there, there is one aspect of community that lacked in this one, big time. And I have a theory about what is the most important aspect of a community, right? It's not the free food, you know, the, the, the dancing and goofing around and joking. It's none of that. It's something else. But I want to ask you first, because I have my own experience. And, and before I tell you my idea, because it is part of this answer, mm -hmm. what part of community, you know, with your, with your parents, with your best friend, Teddy, right? Um, what part of that helped you? And what perhaps was lacking? Mm. Because if it wasn't lacking, then perhaps that would have fulfilled the ice bath mm -hmm. at that time and would have fulfilled the four medications. Mm -hmm. Now, again, also me, I'm not discounting the effect of medication. A lot of people need that to survive. Fair enough, but you clearly don't, right? So what could have happened at that time? That is a great question. So the what I have found is that through my teaching experience with um, – Teaching experience, I would say, with people at all spectrums of that of that privilege walk, right? One thing that good communities have are people to say and remind you to be proud of yourself. And there's a lot of different ways you can phrase that, right? We call that a lot of different things. That might be that might be like you might you might just call some people might just call that love. But others might just call that motivation. Um, but if there's, if you are safe is one really important phrase that I've learned. I am proud of you is the second most important phrase. Maybe tied, maybe tied for first too. Um, because our, our brains need to hear that message for your happy hormones <laughs> to release. And it's either because you are proud of yourself or someone else is proud of you for doing something. And I think relationships, relationships that not only teach you how to say that to yourself by encouraging you to do hard things, to take risks, to fail and be safe failing and learn from failure and pick up again and do that, that's critical. But also, people cheering you on for the big things, the little things, that is the most important part of community to me. And um, that, um, that is what picked me up. That is what picked me up from my pit of despair. That mechanism right there. Now, I think I'm super fascinated by mental health and I'm I'm really um fascinated with with anxiety and depression and so we know that there's some genetic components to it right and one thing that 
that we don't go into enough and and I wish teachers were taught more of this too is like generational trauma and Huberman had a really great episode a couple of weeks ago and like I haven't Israeli, finished it Israeli professor, yes yeah. yes yeah yeah about how do we inherit memory which is cr- mind-boggling right and so um I do have a genetic predisposition to to depression it's uh, um that's one thing that I've learned um and because so, of twenty three and me, or um, because of 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 experience, okay, okay. yeah, and and um, you know from the past, okay. yeah, 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 and um, so that is really, really, really interesting too, just like genetic predisposition, because I think that also maybe and and maybe a a metaphor for that is if you did fall into the pit of despair, how deep would your well be? So. I think some people with with fewer genetic predispositions, it would be like, oh, it's like the one inch dip. Oh, I can I can step right out of this. Right. Whereas other individuals who have generationally been through a boatload of trauma. Right. Um, And we we, that's why I love science, too, is we don't know all the mechanisms yet. We still haven't figured out exactly how this works. But um, if if someone has been through a lot of trauma and, and throughout generations, that person's pit of despair may be f- four stories lo- like into the ground. Hi, right? wow. how are you going to climb out of that without help, without a ladder? <laughs> um, and so I think genetic inheritance and um, and the environmental relationships, and I think and I I've epigenetics from what I learned in college is different from what I, from what I from the the field right now and so um but i epigenetics generally refers to the relationship between your environment and your genetics and how genetic expression is regulated by your environment so um i think that's also another fascinating area too why why do some people get depressed and not others um now what's so one thing that was missing for me is um genes that didn't make me as predisposed right literally one thing that I, i do believe is missing and then also, I, one thing that I've been working on a lot as, my, as, a, as an adult is like my self-soothing toolbox. How, when I have very strong emotions, what are healthy tools to respond? And I'm so glad that there are teachers now that are teaching more kids to meditate, to like think about an emotion. How does it manifest in your body? So it doesn't, so you're thinking, about the details of the emotion and then letting it go, like feeling it, acknowledging it and letting it go. So it doesn't encompass us, right? Um, I, I, I didn't have a strong enough self-soothing toolbox. And I, lo- I really like this, that toolbox analogy because it, it, it's different for every people. And there are some detrimental mechanisms that people use as their self-soothing toolbox, right? Like in response to trauma, what happens? Alcoholism, drug addiction, right? So I didn't have a strong enough self-soothing toolbox. Um, and and I also I also think that developing your self, self-soothing toolbox changes your inner monologue too. And so I, I didn't have a strong enough inner monologue either too. And that, go, that digs into internal validation, right? And so I'm so grateful like just so beyond grateful because i feel like tulum has taught me so much about these areas everyone every soul i've met here is someone working on healing and so i feel like i've learned so many different ways of talking to myself kindly about like good mantras to have and motivational things about yourself and and taking time i feel like here in tulum People, this is the only place I've ever been in the world in 36 countries and countless cities where if you say someone, I can't make it tonight because I need to process some emotion from something that happened, people will be like, oh yeah, I just understand. Take all the time that you need in the whole world. Like, like, please. No one gets that anywhere else in the world. That's totally invalid. You wouldn't even say it. They wouldn't even say it. No. And so this is, this is the most special place I've ever visited in my life. It really, really is. And, um, I'm so grateful that discussing emotion and discussing our relationships to ourselves is 
not only normalized here, but encouraged. Like it's really encouraged here. And and I think we we've just been able to learn so much like everyone here has been able to learn so much more about themselves just from sharing and, and commonality. But now I really want to hear about what you think the most important part of community is. My favorite books on that bookshelf are two, uh, Anna Karenina and uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So Anna Karenina, if there's any book that's going to teach you about the fallacies of being human, <laughs> it's that one. Um, and I won't, I won't spoil it for you, but I, I learned, you learned so much about the balance behind following your heart and following your mind. And that book also, obviously Tolstoy, like very interesting perspectives about being a woman too. And I also, you get really mad reading that book as a woman because there's so much helplessness in, <laughs> in it. And that was another, it, it's weird, but it, it reads like a good soap opera and also sometimes about like, okay, here is, here's who I don't want to be as a woman. <laughs> I want to, um, I want to be stronger than some of these characters and, and not let the world make decisions for me. I want to make my own decisions and, and create my own path. And then goodness, there's so much good stuff in, in meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Like um, I keep a list of, of quotes on my phone from, from him. And because I think when we were thinking about talking earlier about like, what was I missing too? A lot of those explicitly said guiding principles about balancing your, it, uh, balancing the boat, about keeping things steady, about trusting yourself. And those are, these are two things that I work on the most with myself is trusting yourself, self-worth, right? And therefore also boundaries. Like meditations teaches you when to cut someone off. <laughs> so we, I think we can stay more in tune with ourselves when we have better boundaries. When you don't allow the world to, to permeate you in ways that are going to take you away from your goals and from you being the most authentic version of you and the happiest version of you. So those are my two. Which are your two? You're not allowed to ask me. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you the ones that I recently read because mm -hmm. um, it, it'll take me a long time to pick my two favorites. It's going to be a hard <laughs> one. Uh, Love at Goon Park. Ooh. I just finished. That's the Har Harry Harlow book. It's the biography of Harry. And... Um, um, the second one, that's my favorite. It would have to be meditations as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, meditations, I basically read every year, mm -hmm. usually on my birthday, I start reading it and finish it in a month or so. Uh, but yeah, those two stand out. Um, Gulag, I've read about 70%. Mm -hmm. And recently I stopped reading it because uh, it was so dense. I was reading it at night helped me fall asleep very easy. It, it just became too dense. And I said, I, I thought, I'm not like in love with it. Yeah. I was kind of reading it to get a sense of Stalin and the prisons and how horrible their lives were. Fair enough. Some of the chapters, like the in interrogation chapters and the torture, you know, the 21 uh, ways they tortured prisoners. Like that was cool. You know? Yeah. Like uh, my shadow dark side was like, ah, yeah, this yeah. is cool. But now it's like this case, this case, this case, this is how much they bribed. And, and it's like, mm, I'm going to take a break from it. So I, I, I took a break. And, um, but yeah, I mean, Carl Jung stuff. I, Robert Sapolsky, if you haven't read his stuff, um, all, I have all his books. Um, I finished two of them. Two of them I'm close to finishing and one I haven't started. But Robert Sapolsky is a Stanford professor. Mm -hmm. He's the guy, uh, Huberman interviewed him as well. Mm. Um, he is... Um, he spent 35 years in the Serengeti in Kenya studying baboons. Wow. So he's a primatologist, a yeah. neuroscientist. Um, the Trouble with Testosterone, you see the first mm -hmm. one on the left, that's his book. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's very, like, when he speaks, you can feel pain wow. because he's, he's gone through so much 
like life and death experiences. Mm -hmm. He's seen things in baboons, mm -hmm. which he relates to humans, right? And and so you you feel how much suffering he's gone through and how how much hopelessness he has for the human species. Wow. You feel that in everything he says. Wow. Yeah. Goodness. Robert Sapolsky, one of my favorite guys. His newest book, I, I emailed him a couple of weeks ago and he's like, uh, sorry, I'm writing a book. Like I can't, yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah, like yeah, read yeah, emails. Yeah. But he's writing a book right now called Determined, okay. The Science of Life Without Free Will. I need to read that. Because he doesn't believe in free will at all. Zero. Wow. Like he jokes that yeah. for people who believe in choice and all that, he jokes about yeah. it. And the book Behave is, is, is about that too. But um, going back to um, community. For me, it's a feeling inside mm -hmm. that I would love to have. And that is, Whatever your emotions are, they're okay. It's okay to have those desires, those negative or positive or whatever mm -hmm. feelings. It's all right, buddy. It's all good. You can feel that. That, when that gets suppressed, and usually from my experience, it gets suppressed because we are not able to do this. See this right here? So for me, the, the biggest takeaway from the podcast so far, our, ours as well as all the others, is the therapy I get from it. It's profound therapy. Because I can honestly say things for whatever reason maybe the, there's like some authority that this thing gives i have no idea but there is something that allows me to be more of myself than i would be otherwise mm. and it it allows me to go into some zone which i can't do in real life for some reason it's something weird it's something you know how you talk about the cold exposure and the ice bath there's a, like a, it's at a certain moment mm -hmm. you like become one with the water or you know the runner's high you know in the marathon yes. i'm yeah. sure you had it many yep. times after you know 30 minutes hour and a half you're like you're like one with it and so this feeling when i get during a conversation is akin to that. So for me, it's this. It's uh, the community giving me the permission to be myself. Mm -hmm. That. And the idea that, that came to me today, literally this morning, I was meditating. and So, so I wake up at four every day. It's like a standard. And uh, first half an hour, I just stay in the bed and just close my eyes and like, go wherever it goes. God knows where. I don't even know if we can call it meditation. It's just like, I'm just with myself. And then I come here and I set up and work and stuff. Um, so the idea sort of emerged where if people in the world, and again, just because, just like you're, you know, concentrating on women's hormones, I'm concentrating on men's hormones and men's health and all that. If men had the ability to share anonymously what their true feelings are those who can't most people can't even afford a therapist right that's a hard one or are shamed of going to a therapist or or feel inferior right so if we have a platform right you can call it a men's circle you can call it an initiation whatever you want to call it where a bunch of men come together virtually and in person is also good, but virtually is at least something. It's a start where you give each person, just like a men's circle, you give them some time, a minute, two minutes, to speak about their deepest, darkest stuff that is lurking in their subconscious mind. And we all listen. 
and we just take turns one after another, one after another, right? And hearing all of these different men talk about their deepest, darkest secrets, and the person who's listening, first of all, it's anonymous. So nobody knows your name. You don't have to show your face. And guess what? You don't, it doesn't even have to be your voice. Because if you type it, the facilitator will say it. So at least you'll hear your words from someone else's voice. And doing that regularly, all over the world, but it's all virtual. People from all sorts of backgrounds, right? And now what you've done is you've taken technology, right, the internet, and you've actually formed real connection with emotion, right? Because, and this is something I learned from Jordan Peterson, Paul Conti, all the clinical psychologists, and that is listening is it, right? Jordan, I, I listened to a podcast yesterday. He said, the hardest thing for a human to do is write in an articulate way. And the second hardest thing is to listen. And to listen in a way that it's not like you're trying to get the next word. You're listening to this person. You're giving them space. And if that can be done in a, an environment like a... And I don't even know if these types of things exist. It doesn't matter. Many, many should exist. Where imagine when I was 16 or 17, I had this. I would be like, hey... I uh, I have this desire, right? Like my mom, you know, I, I, I believe that my religion tells me to not desire women, to, to be shame, ashamed of sex, but I don't want to feel this shame. Why do I feel this shame? Is, it, is this my fault? Just saying that. You don't even need a, someone mm -hmm. to reply. Mm -hmm. Just saying that, getting it off. That, that body keeps the score, right? Yes. Yes. That is such, first of all, that, that definitely needs to be a thing if that's not already a thing. And I think it is so interesting because I see this happening on Reddit. Reddit. And that is another, this is so fascinating because I've, oh goodness, I learned so much teaching about humanity, right? Adolescents, kids, teenagers, right, are very drawn to anonymous communities where they can freely express their feelings and they are backed up and validated. And what we see is um, when we see, and I didn't expect to go here, here today, but here we are, um, mass violence in America, shooters, right? A lot of times they are people who were bullied and were excluded from their communities and they found a home online. And if we can flip that and, and do it for good, do it super intentionally for good, there absolutely is such a big need for that. And one thing is really cool is I actually see this in a similar way for women. There is a period tracking app that I use called Flow and they have on the bottom, there's four tabs. There's one like your cycle, your, your symptoms, settings. And then in the middle right there is secret chats. And I have, I, I have seen the most beautiful, supportive, empathetic conversations about things that we are not encouraged to talk about. From obviously there's, there's um, symptom questions. Um, there are pregnancy questions. There are sexual pleasure questions. There are mental health questions. And, and everyone's, everyone has an avatar. You, you log into that app anonymously. And it's super beautiful. And I think you kind of understand this as a facilitator, right? How can we facilitate these environments to make people feel safe? And when given the opportunity, when... And yes, people are much more willing to share anonymously. Boy, will they share. And I also learned this through the pandemic when I was teaching on Zoom. What was participation like when you had kids have to have their camera on versus when they had to keep it off? And I was allowing them to respond in the chat. 
So obviously ideal world is you have a beautifully facilitated conversation between 20 humans on Zoom <laughs> who's, and people are muting mics when they're not talking and unmuting when they are. And that doesn't even occur in a normal adult meeting, right? So we set that expectation for kids. So that's the ideal. That's hard to make happen. So kids, they're afraid of their of showing their backgrounds or whatever in their house. And so can I turn off my background, miss? Like, um, I'm embarrassed. If that's going to, if me allowing the kids to say yes to keep them in the lesson, to allow them to engage, absolutely, right? Everything's a trade-off. So yes, yes. The more we can, in, in, more we can help people feel safe to allow them to feel comfortable to share their experiences. And as you just said, to unload that burden on their back, off their backs so they can, they can relieve themselves of any guilt, of any fear, of any, any negativity and move on to the next great thing that they're building in their life. We have to do that. We have to do that. I'm very, very curious about, um, about how, how we are going to be using more technology and AI in the mental health field. I'm very, very, very curious to see what the next year, three years, five years, 10 years are going to look like for that. Yeah. One uh, thing you mentioned is about regulation, mm -hmm. right? And I know that in schools, if teachers were to give any kind of mental health advice, like in private school, maybe it's different because it's more automated, you know, it's, it's automated or not automated. It's um, there's an independent thinker, which is the teacher. Whereas in public school, everything is like robotic. So if there was a way to make things more independent, then wouldn't there be lawsuits and, oh, the teacher told my son to do this. And so perhaps the reason the structure exists and also the pharmaceutical structure exists is because people just don't want to get sued. Like nowadays, I've, I've heard that psychiatrists basically just believe whatever the diagnosis is by the patient. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, I Googled this um, and I know... Uh, right now, there's a big debate on gender identity and blah, 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 in the U.S. especially. And so if if a child wants to switch gender and the, the doctor is like, you're crazy, he may not be able to say that. And he just has to go through it because his job is on the line and his family's well-being is on the line. So how do we add this parameter of certification, qualification? Because if you're not board certified... How are you going to have a mental health anything? Right. With like a hundred disclaimers. Yes. Yes. And that's so when we're talking about mental health and I mean, as as a in the wellness industry in general, and I think I like to hope that most people do this no matter what industry they're in, actually first do no harm. <laughs> and in whether it's an interpersonal client relationship because I, I go into this with my, with my clients. I go into mental health with my clients because I, I cannot not deliver a holistic approach. You are an entire human being. If we want to become healthier, we got it. It's mind, body, soul. So first, do no harm. Most harmful thing you can do is make someone relive trauma. Don't have them relive the trauma. If someone's not comfortable sharing, don't ask about it. If always ask permission, right? And Yes, there are times where um, a very well-trained professional can do that, will help that person relive it in a healthy way to change the inner dialogue, right? Um, it, I think some of that is called inner child work these days too. Um, that's professional level. That is that is. Psych, clinical psychologist level work that unless you are a clinical psychologist, you should never do. That is not your role. And I say that very strongly because I had someone try to do that to me recently. And I, and who was not, who was not certified. And, um, I was for furious. Um, so please first do no harm. If you're not trained in, 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 and helping people in helping people work through trauma and specifically recounting it and reliving it. That's not your, that's not your lane, but you can help in other ways. And here's how I, 
getting people really in tune with the body. What is your physiological stress uh, stress response? I notice I get warm. I notice I get warm. Um, I notice I stumble more in sentences. I I notice I tap my leg a lot. Those are stress responses. Okay, we work on recognizing those early signs, and then we work on tools to cope. So first, it's observation. The second is acknowledgement. What emotion is it really? Why why am I stressed? Is it I'm I'm and 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 learning to name it, learning to call a spade a spade, learning to name an emotion for what it really is, right? Stress is not an emotion. <laughs> Stress is the manifestation of an emotion. And I think a lot, and there are a lot of people that are really, really, really stressed, but they don't know why the underlying motion, emotion of it is. Is it because you are scared, f- scared of failing at work? Is it because you are angry with your boss for giving you that workload <laughs> on the weekend? Is it um, because you are sad that you are missing out on doing something and you otherwise have to work. Um, Many different, many, many different actual emotions. And so first we recognize the body's response. Second, you name the emotion, what it actually is. And even better, where in the body is it? A lot of people, how many people do we know have tight, bad upper, upper neck area or bad lower back? A lot of women don't know this, but they carry all their stress in their hips. The hips are, can, I had an acupuncturist once tell me that sometimes stress in the hips is like an onion. Like you will, you'll, cause it was acupuncture and it was like, we peeled off one layer and then she moved the needle and it was like another, another. And women store a lot of, a lot of stress in our hips. So that is something that you can help people with very easily. That's, that's noting a body observation. Some people aren't as comfortable talking about their emotions and that's also okay. We, you, they, we might say, what do you call this? You might have a different word for an emotion. Um, and then response. Responses, different responses work for different people. So I actually, I, and I, I like to name this the self-soothing toolkit. Like what is in your self-soothing toolkit? And I really, I would love if we all talked about this more because I think there are so many strategies out there that I don't know, that you don't know, that, that we just haven't heard of before. So I have different strategies for different, emotions too. So for example, when I'm angry, I need to sprint or lift something really heavy. Um, if you've ever caught me screaming in the wind on my scooter, I'm sorry, but that's a, that's, a, that's something I allow myself to do. <laughs> um, uh, versus, um, sadness is like, I will, I'll journal about it. I'll sit and meditate with it. I'll, I'll dig into a lot of gratitude practice. Um, I might call a friend or my mom um, versus overwhelm. Um, Overwhelm is usually fear of failure. So digging into how, how, how real is the possibility I'm actually going to fail? Usually it's just, it's like, yeah, it's big, but no, it's boosting yourself up. It's a little bit of self-talk work Um, or just, Sometimes when we're fearing failure, sometimes the answer isn't to work harder. <laughs> sometimes it's to allow yourself to relax, take a bubble bath. I like to go for a long walk to play with my dog or something like that. And so that those are safe areas that everyone can work on without having people relive through stuff. How can we, how can we encourage people to recognize, acknowledge, and, and, um, regulate their emotional responses with intention. I love that. (laughs) Thank you. Really good. Thanks. Are there any myths that women believe in health that doesn't allow them to get to their goals? So I'll give you an example about with my mom. So my mom, um, about a year ago, more or less. Um, I saw her um, having knee problems, right? So she, we were in Montreal. We were, you know, family reunion. My parents came from Texas. I went from here. And I saw my mom going down the stairs and she was like holding the railing, 
you know, the little bar. And I was like, what? That's weird. Mom, what are you doing? Why can't you just walk down the stairs like normal people? Mm. She's like, oh, because uh, I have pain. Like I have pain in my knee as I walk down the stairs. I'm like, what? Pain in your knee? So what's going on? Now, I didn't, I didn't necessarily see it from her perspective. I saw it from an ego perspective that, hey, I failed somewhere. Like, I took the responsibility on my shoulders that my mom is this way because of me. So I was like, okay, well, it's time to do something about it. So I told my mom that same day, I'm like, look, I just spent some time thinking about what just happened. And, and then I also talked to my mom and she said, you know, she went to her doctor. The guy said she needs knee surgery, you know, knee replacement surgery, whatever. And uh, she was trying to gather up enough money to pay for it, all that. So I told my mom that uh, I don't believe in all this crap, this surgery crap, bullshit, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Tulum. I'm going to get Martha. We're going to come. We live in Euless, Texas. It's a city in Texas called Euless. We're going to come to Euless. We're going to stay near you somewhere. And I'm going to train you for three months. I'm going to plan out your diet. We're going to work out together. We're going to go to Austin to see my, my, you know, the trainer that I train with, Sumer. He's in Austin. We're going to go to Austin every fucking week if we have to. It doesn't matter. Um, and we're going to figure this out in three months. And after I leave and go back to Tulum, because I can't give you more than three months, unfortunately, um, I'm going to keep coming back. And I'm going to give you a year. So until your next birthday, which is uh, just, what, four days ago. It was my mom's birthday. Um, you're going to have me. And we're going to figure this out. You're not going to need surgery. So my mom used to believe, she was about 210, 210 pounds, but she's like, a, yeah, like something like 5'2", right? And um, what she used to believe, that losing weight is impossible. She used to believe that her Letting go of the junk foods is impossible. Learn helplessness. Typical example. Of course, now she has a community and my, my grandma and my aunts, everyone's you know, calling her all the time. So she's like, she has this, this uh, sort of positive environment yeah. which doesn't let her fall into the depression. She's also like genetically and she's predisposed to happiness and all that. So in these three months, she went from like 210 to something like uh, 180, right? Uh, knee, knee, knee issues went away. We kept going to Austin and, you know, Sumer trained her and she worked hard, really hard. Uh, you know, did the intermittent fasting, you know, ate two times a day, let go of all the junk foods, you know, ate organic and all that. And then, and then I left. I came back to Tulum. Oh, I, we went to Playa and Merida, but now I'm in, we're in Tulum, but we're in Mexico. And uh, now from 180, she's at 170, right? So 40 pounds-ish she lost in the last year. And, uh, you know, she can walk. She can dance. She, you know, got on a boat and, like, we went boating. Like, a lot of, uh, she can cook without any pain, right? She can do all these things. And, and, like, literally her life has changed. And my dad told me, too. He's like, oh, my God. Her life changed. But... From this experience, I believe that if I wasn't a tyrant, it wouldn't have happened. Because my dad has been trying, my aunt has been trying, the, her little sister has been trying, right? And I remember the first week I went to, to Ulysses, we visited my sweetie auntie, she's a younger sister, and she's like, uh, Farhan, if anyone can do it, you can, because we all tried, you know, good luck, because this ain't going to be easy. So all the myth that my mom used to believe about health and what to eat and all the misinformation that we've believed since we were kids, there may be certain big myths that women believe about their hormones or their weight, mental health, spiritual health. They believe this like hardcore, but they're wrong. 
My, there's two. This one pisses me off to no end. You are not beautiful. The second, on a very different note, woman can't, shouldn't lift weights. They're going to get bulky. <laughs> Those are the two most horrific, negative, dangerous, common narratives in our society that are the reason I wake up every day and I do what I do. Because so much of culture, so much of pop culture, TV, movies, me media, social media teaches us that. Books, too. Stories. They teach... They teach the narrative of, of, the, of the woman to want to be fragile, docile. No, 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 no. Those days, those days are over. And that's also, so because those are the two most infrequent, those are the most, excuse me, those are the most frequent myths, there is so much work in, in kind of, exactly as you said, you had to be a tyrant. You had to go through diet you had to go through diet training and and in those training conversations there were also definitely well there were some mindset conversations about believing she could be pain-free about believing she could get to the other side right and so that's why you need to take a it, it's a it's a holistic approach you have to take care of mind body and soul and so that is that's that's that hits the nail on on the first one you are you are beautiful in the body that you have right now as you are. And let's go, let's go into woman, woman should not lift weights. You're going to get bulky. So one of my, the most interesting things I've seen is those, those memes that have the, the female body or the male body too. And throughout every decade, what's the best, what's, what was the attractive body in each decade? And then you, I, I think this is a really important conversation to have with especially teenagers and adolescents and goodness gracious, like eating disorders are such a big problem in our country because around the world, because people are trying to, women are encouraged to be smaller. They're encouraged to be less. How dare society? How dare we? How dare anyone keep pushing that narrative? Um, and so when we can get to younger minds earlier and encourage young women to say no, you are strong. You have a, not only a powerful mind, but you have a very powerful body. And here's all the things you can do with it. And there is, um, I, I just think it's, it's, this is why I train the way I train is because I just like being able to do things. I, I, for example, and I think this actually goes back to just like inner child work too, actually. Like we are all children who like to play at heart, right? And Instead of so much of focus, oh goodness, I'm so, I'm so tired of this. So much of fitness is just focused on aesthetics these days. And what happened to, or when can we finally be, be strong so that we can play harder? Even if you're not an athlete, right? Like I did the pegboard at jungle gym the other day and that was so fun. Um, it was really hard. It took me a couple of tries and I was way too short for it, but it was fun. Um, and we don't play enough as humans. We don't, um, which goes back into our earlier conversation about the matrix and, and, and social expectations. So, but those are the two most common mis misconceptions. Um, and weights, every woman should lift weights. Resistance training, as, as, you, so, as you know, goodness gracious, it helps maintain and build bone density. Resistance training is the only form of exercise that will build bone density. And another thing that I think we don't, I think everyone doesn't really think about is, um, or especially when, when we're younger, right? The effect of age, right? Maybe there's a misconception of, I'll be able to do this forever. My body isn't going to change. And that might be in a positive way or a negative way. Maybe you're really healthy right now, but you don't really do much. And you're like, I'm going to be able to ride this wave forever. Or as the opposite, as you, as you were um, dealing with with your mom, my body's never going to change. So menopause. Every woman goes through it. If they make it past uh, late 40s, starting early 50s. 
and we don't talk about it enough. What happens with menopause? And this is why I encourage women. This is a big thing about why I encourage women to to start resistance training. I talk about menopause with my 18 year old clients. <laughs> I'm like, look what's coming for you down the line. Decreases in estrogen result in a decrease in progesterone. We have estrogen receptors in, in skeletal muscle tissue. They're finding in cardiovascular muscle tissue. We lose a tremendous amount of strength during menopause. This is what the studies have found. Um, and so the beautiful thing though, is that they found that women who resistance train before menopause. So if you're not doing it right now, start, but if no matter at what point you start, if you start resistance training, you will help decrease bone loss, muscle loss. You will um, maintain function. And I think all we want to do is live happy, independent lives, right? And so setting ourselves up as women for that future is so important too. So um, those, are the, those are my three biggest misconceptions that I see. <laughs> wow, I, I agree with you. And one thing about menopause from a testosterone perspective mm -hmm. is that uh, testosterone also goes down. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is when they increase testosterone in these menopausal women, they tend to have an increase in spatial memory. Mm. This is something that's seen what like so many studies with this. And because spatial memory is something that goes down, I mean, for men too, but especially in women, they saw this increase and it was very nice. Uh, yeah, it, it's a very interesting topic. And one thing you said about, about aesthetics is one of the questions I wrote actually for you. Um, and, and this is sort of like the last topic we'll talk about because it's uh, very important to me. And that is shallow versus deep, right? So in the world, we are pulled towards both extremes. But I would say from a consumer perspective, it's more of the shallow, right? So for instance, um, if you... Let's say if you talk to someone and they say um, they are this profession, right away, you're going to think, oh, he makes this much money, right? Shallow. Or let's say you meet someone new, you shake their hand. And let's say, I don't know, uh, they have like one of those uni brows, whatever, right? Uh, oh, he's, he's, he's like a weird guy. Look at this uni brow. What the hell is he doing? Why doesn't he just cut this off, right? Shallow right? Or if you, let's say, you get introduced at a party to a friend and they say, hey, oh, meet my friend. And let's say this friend, everyone is wearing clothes, you know, like suits and all that, some high, high party. And this guy's wearing a hoodie. He's like, oh, this guy probably is like, he's poor or something. Why does he dress like a homeless guy? Shallow, right? Everything is sort of observed and taken from a shallow way. But the hypothesis that I've come to in my own life is that the only reason we see others as shallow is because we see ourselves as shallow. So if I haven't gone to the depths of my own subconscious mind, where I've gone to depths where I can see not what I can use myself for, because we always think of how can I use myself, right? So when I was doing my grad school, it's like, how can I use my brain to make my brain better, <laughs> right? How can I become smarter, right? How can I use this degree to get to this? How can I use Instagram to get this, right? It's use. So when we think of ourselves as being used, we start using other people. Oh, hey. This person is fat and, and I've been told that this, this is not beautiful because it's like some weight is there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make fun of this person, right? This is known as displaced aggression, right? And so in rat studies, when a rat bites another rat, his baseline cortisol goes down. And we do this all the time as humans, right? We insult people like Twitter, right? We, we scold people. We, 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 we talk shit about them. We complain literally this just lowers our stress levels it works right so if we have this in society right now where we look at the shallow and we don't go deeper and thus we are also not going deeper within ourselves what can we do as individuals 
because I know that when we talked about the system, you know, the school system and, and the regulation and the, the private schools, like there's all this system stuff, right? But if you listen to Carl Jung, his one of his basic tenets is the individual can do everything. One guy can change the world. So what can a person do? I have some theories about this too, but what can a person do as he walks through life, taking his shame, his trauma, you know, his inner child torture, walking around with him? What can you do in a very simple way, easy to do stuff that allows the depth to become unveiled? I have a simple answer, but it's a, not an easy thing. <laughs> Learn to love yourself, <laughs> which is so easily said and so hardly done, right? And what you're saying and what you're asking goes back to what we were, we were talking about, about self-talk and about how we so rare, we have a hard time being one with ourselves. And I've, I've, I've learned so much from, from people here. This is the most highly concentrated community of people who are learning to get to know themselves. That's why this Tulum is a special place. And that's why I am always coming back here because you don't find this anywhere else in the world. And it goes back to feeling safe enough to be able to get to know yourself. It's all related. So what does that mean? What can you do on a daily basis? I like to teach in this concept called deep health. Deep health encourages mental, emotional, physical, environmental, relational, and existential health. So on those pillars, and you could Google this. This is a great, brilliant principle. I learned it from Precision Nutrition, Dr. John Bonardi. And it says, okay, instead of looking at aesthetics, what if I'm doing healthier habits, how are these healthier habits affecting these six areas of my life? Am I relating better to people socially? Am I, am I able to remember more? So when we are learning to love ourselves, the simplest thing you can do is learn to sit with your thoughts for a minute. I've found that people that can't, they either they themselves can't be quiet and who can't shut their minds off because they're constantly ruminating about what they should be doing or, yeah, what they should be doing to be successful because they fear rejection so strongly by some person or entity that they are obsessed with thinking of solutions or catastrophizing. So learning to sit by yourself and to meditate for a minute is the greatest thing you can do for yourself. I actually started, used to start every science class with a minute of meditation. And the kids loved it. They loved being able to just sit. And, and when you can get in tune with your body and your breathing, our breathing tells us so much about ourselves. Our breathing tells us so much about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. The depth, how much are you expanding your stomach? How is it staying more in your chest? Is the air cool? Is it hot? What is what does my exhale sound like? Am I breathing more through my nose, through my mouth? And when we when we get to know our breath and our bodies, you're you're able to just get to know yourself better. So that's the by learning to meditate for just a minute, sitting with yourself, you're saying you are teaching yourself that you are safe as you are without solving whatever you're obsessed with thinking about. I call it a thought tornado. So you're allowing the, th you are flicking away, trying to flick away the thought tornado. And um, after, when you're able to do that and then you're able to build on a meditation practice by incorporating mantras, what area, what area, what are there any themes of thoughts that come up that you need to do more work on to, to, to improve your inner monologue? Or is it, is it more response? Is it boundaries? Is it one person 
that's that's setting you off? Do we have to re- do I have to cut people out of my life? I like to say that you are you get to curate, right? You get to curate everything about your life. And that's another great thing about deep health too is you realize just how many other things you have control over, where you live. As you know, like stress, things that stress us out, they come in all forms, such as noise on a street, barking do- barking dogs, access to resources, um, your support community, as we've talked so much about. You actually, you have a lot of control over that. And I think a lot of people think they're stuck in a place and they can't do anything about it. You can. It's up to you. You get to carry your life. And that's another thing I say about algorithms. You are your algorithm is a big motto that I tell people. Unfollow people that make you think negatively about yourself or make you doubt yourself. Mute personal close friends who are not helping you meet your goals or are putting out content that's distracting you away from your goals or are making you feel bad about yourself. Curate yourself. Before someone else does it. Before the, yeah, seriously, will. seriously. Will. seriously. Yeah. Um, and the final question. I don't you. get to hear your answer. about well, What's the question? About um, the initial one. It was, um, what's one thing people can do every day? Man, I rarely get questions. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you what helps me. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certain events that have happened in my childhood that are trapped in my memory and they trap me deeply trap me Mm -hmm. and i know they're important because they happened for such a short time and i remember them vividly like i remember the scene and where everyone was and this is like when i was like six right Mm -hmm. these these events have happened and I know memory is, is tricky, right? The memory reconsolidation happens where, you know, we used to have this memory model where we thought, well, you know, when you sleep, your memory gets consolidated and, you know, from short term to long term, it gets stored in the cortex, fine. Now, for about maybe the last 15 to 20 years, there's a new model. And actually, one of my colleagues at McGill discovered this. And he basically showed that there is protein synthesis that happens when you recall a memory. And that is known as memory reconsolidation. And essentially, whatever events have happened in your life will be recalled based on your current state. So you're happy and you recall a memory, it'll be something. When you're sad, you recall the same memory, it'll be different. So 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 I you know I, I tend to take my memories with a grain of salt. But I still consider them because I I more look at the feeling of it, not the exact details of it. So what I've been doing is uh, I'm doing a a lot of trauma work for myself, Mm. you know, reading from experts, watching podcasts like Dr. Paul Conti is one of them that I'm studying. Uh, Gabor Mate is another one, right? And um, rather than relying on like plant medicine, because I know Tulum has a lot of this stuff, I, I would rather not... Because I don't feel that right now. I'm more, hey, let me resolve it in my way because I'm enough, right? I'm enough uh, thing. And so I recall these memories. I sit with them and I let my imagination go, right? Like, okay, so this happened. This is how I felt. This is the guilt I had. This is the shame I had. And that's hard. It's so hard to do this because I've suppressed it for days decades literally so i'm like okay this happened and then this happened and then this is what my mom said and then this is what my dad's face looked like okay and then i write type or i write it's all different right like when you type your brain does something different when you write it does something different when you think it does something different when you talk it does something it's like all these different learning abilities different intelligences so i do all of this and um then when I'm ready, I talk about it in a video and I publish it. Because publishing something that I know Martha will watch, my parents will watch, my brother will watch, all the, my friends will watch, 
it allows me to be free of judgment. And that is evidence that it's okay. Right? And it's hard, Rachel. Like, it's hard. I, one, of my, um, one of my colleagues, Gertie from Albania, he's been with us for like five years, really awesome guy. He wrote me a, a list of problems that uh, he's facing and other people are facing. And one of them was about relationships and uh, financial freedom and all that. And uh, I made a video about it. It was like an hour long video. And I think they published it just now. Because when I went in the room, Martha was listening to it. And uh, that video was hard to make. Because it's like, as you're speaking, shit is happening here. Like stomach is telling you, oh my God, you're going to say that? Oh my God, you're going to tell the truth? Oh my God, are you really okay with this? And I pay attention and I still say it. I pay attention, I still say it. And that reaching deep allows me to see other people's pain. So now like when I'm in the world, I'm not like this person has this title. Oh, she's the receptionist. Or, or he's the CEO. No, no, no. No, no, no. They're not that. Uh-uh. There's something else. And the more I accept all of these things, the better I can listen to people. And when I'm listening, I'm not like, what is the content? Like, the content doesn't matter. Who is this person? Like, this is a person? Like, what? Human? I'm a human? What? Like, what is this stuff? Like, this is such weird shit. So I allow myself to, how we started the conversation, to be in awe of all this mess, <laughs> this chaos everywhere. <laughs> so that's helped me the most. This is my way of um, going through it. And you know what? I really like it. I really like this stuff. Because whenever I listen to someone talk about it, or whenever I go into these moments of imagination, right? Um, it takes me to places that I need to go. I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you for doing that. That's such hard, hard work. And I, first of all, it's, it's hard going there privately. And then the way that you have taught yourself to push yourself to do that publicly and then release that, because I think that it's, it sounds like that's what you're doing. You're using this video platform to release and to say, I am worthy even though I have gone through all of these things, even no matter what emotion I hold onto any of those experiences. And, and that is, that is unique. That is profound. And that is something really incredible that you're doing. And I am definitely going to try some of, some of that. <laughs> I don't, I, and who knows that, that, that the video parts, that's very scary for me. That's why it's even more impressive. Um, but that, and, and, and I'm thinking about as what you were saying, the way that you're able to relate to people. It's one, it's really interesting. There's a whole debate about ADHD, right? It's, it's, is it just a state of mind that the brain enters when it's doing stuff it's not interested in? And have I found that, I mean, I'm clinically diagnosed with ADHD, but have I found that to be true? Absolutely. Like the, when I don't want to do something, I'm way worse at it. Um, and so that's that's my whole uh, rant with the education system too. <laughs> to, to go into why we have increases in childhood ADHD. But one thing I was told, there's another perspective too that I think is interesting. And I'm 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 a learner. I just I love learning about different people's perspectives and and who knows what's right and wrong, right? We we have not discovered absolutely everything about any topic. So another perspective is that ADHD years, um, it is a uh, inhibition disorder. So they tend to interrupt. We tend to interrupt people. We tend to forget things. It's, it's, um, but one th a fascinating, fascinating characteristic of a lot of ADHDers is that we are very attuned 
to people's body language and their emotional states. That's one thing I've read. So that's another reason why I've always wanted to work with people and why I cherish, cherish working one-to-one with people because I am good at reading people and I'm bad at a lot of other things, but I, but I, but I lean in, I love leaning into that strength and I'm, I'm grateful that I do have that gift. So when you go through the world like that, you're hundred percent, right? No one's a job title. Everyone is a, is a whole human being with gr- dreams and goals and emotions. And, um, one of my favorite things, fa- favorite things that I started to do that has helped me infinitely in life. You know how you're not you're not only this this human meat sack, right? This meat suit. But you are a whole identity. So I always I notice in conversation and in, in interaction that people who you don't value, you don't know their name. You know I know this from teaching too. How many times like I I didn't, I had a name that most teachers got right, but I mean, how awful is it sitting in the first day of school when a teacher can't say your name right? And then kids are laughing or something like that. Like it's horrible. So what I have done, I have a list of names in my phone. I try to write down and because I know my own weakness too, like I, I'm pretty forgetful with names as well. So usually the first time I learn someone's name, I write it down and then I write down a little thing. Okay. Like um, like met at jungle gym, uh, like really like fascinating doctor or something like that. And that way I have everyone, like my, my, when I lived back in Boston, like the Starbucks person, the male person, like, um, the, the person at like one of the stores I would go into all the time. Um, because what better feeling is it than when you meet someone once and they're like, hi, Rachel. Hi, Farhan. How, how are you? And that's, a, that's something about community that I like building too, is just recognition. Recognition of, of you are a person worthy of me knowing your name just because you exist. That's it. No strings attached. And you know what's this fun? The most interesting thing, I think, is I have become so passionate about talking about this idea that you are worthy just as you are because that has been the single most challenging thing for me to believe in my own life as a result of all my mental health uh, challenges. But the more I say it out loud, and this kind of relates to what you're saying as your own video thing, like, like it is what I believe. It is, it is the truth. And so the more you talk about it, it's your, it's reprogramming your own inner narrative, reprogramming your own mind. And uh, there's, I love the science of, of behavior change, habit change. How many times do you have to do something or think a different way for that train track to finally take the other one? Infinite times. My God. <laughs> wow. So the last question. Yes. Now that you're, you know, leaving Tulum temporarily, going back to Boston. Fair enough. We're going to miss you. Um, Is there a certain challenge or obstacle that you're excited about? Many. (laughs) Many. Um, The challenge that I now have is there are some, these are some surface things. So I'm trying and I, and I haven't figured out exactly what the deeper challenge of all of this. So maybe I'll figure it out while I'm talking. That could be fun. Um, It is work-life balance, maintaining community and um, focusing all at once on launching my my new woman's health company. And 
for for me and i think humans we are social creatures right um i've been working on this project pretty much by myself and so maintaining hope and and belief in this project um but also not getting carried away with it because this is i have been working so hard i haven't taken this much time to not talk <laughs> about my company <laughs> <laughs> and this feels so good. So I cannot thank you enough for, for taking time to, to talk today and for inviting me. Seriously, thank you. Um, and for reminding me of the importance of, of community because it's um, we need it as, as social human beings. So that so balance is balance and balance throughout necessary focus is. <laughs> is is my is my is my biggest challenge right now um yeah maintaining and maintaining belief in in this project in myself that i can execute it too and you get a feeling inside when you know you're on the right track i am one of those people are you like a big person that listens to their gut like do you have a powerful gut i didn't tell you There's this an inner voice yes i remember when i was um This was like 2016. Mm -hmm. It was my birthday. I was reading Marcus Aurelius. And I got to one of his quotes, something about death. You know, he talks a lot about death. So like every quote is about death. But this was like, it really struck me. I was in Toronto at the time. And uh, I was like, shit, I need to be in New York. Rachel, I packed my bags and I left that day. <laughs> I was like, I don't care about my lease. Like whatever, you can take my deposit. I don't care. I left, Right. So that gut thing, good, bad, positive, negative, I don't fucking know. But I follow it. I just follow it. Anyway. Same with me. Okay. Quite, quite similarly. Quite similarly. I mean, when I left for, for the Middle East. It's crazy. Um, when I... This is something I'm, I'm, I am super not proud of. Um, is when I left teaching, I, I left in November, 2021, I was coming back from a wedding in El Salvador. That was my third, it was going to my fourth year of teaching in Philly. And I, I looked around coming from that wedding and I was sitting at a layover in Atlanta and I was like, every single stressor in my life is from this job. I had such a strong gut feeling. I quit. I never set foot in that classroom ever again. And that is the most horrible thing I have ever done to a group. I shouldn't, obviously I shouldn't have started the teaching year. Then I was scared that they wouldn't find the teacher. And so then I was scared those kids would be screwed anyway. And so, I mean, like I, I'm, I, re, I am so sorry like that. And I, I'm, I feel horrible about the additional trauma that I caused on those kids' lives. And that's my responsibility. Like I, I messed up doing that, but I actually, I had such a strong feeling that if I didn't go then I never would, I never would. And then coming to Tulum too, now that I know it's time to leave, but making this company as well. Um, if I go against my gut, my mind will just like do everything to push me back <laughs> the other way. Yeah. You got to make those calls. You got to make I've those made calls. those calls too. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I, maybe it's my training in, in, in science and stuff like the doing the PhD and working with monkeys and you kind of have to not feel emotional sometimes because you're, you know, these monkeys are not like, they're in pain sometimes, they're autistic sometimes. And so you, you have to let go of the immediate feeling. And so whenever I've done things like that, it's been pretty heartless And I've always found a reason why I'm doing it to a bad guy. Oh, that landlord, he was a bad guy. I could, I could screw him over, right? Like shit like that. Um, so I've uh, very easily forgiven myself. But again, it's the depth. Practicing the depth. You know, this person is in pain. They're going to suffer. You can still do the action, but at least have empathy. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and 
Boston is going to be a great place for you. I mean, every place in the world is great <laughs> for you, right? A uh, lot of amazing companies have started in Boston and, you know, that area, the, 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 the nerdy capital of the world. I'm so excited to hang out with nerds. I'm, right? I'm literally going to sit in cafes and look wow. for MIT. Undergra- I love Boston. Female undergraduate, at, like computer science, biology, double majors who okay. might want to build out a woman's health app. <laughs> That's so, And you're looking for a co-founder now? Yeah. Techn- yeah. Technical co-founder? Yes, yeah, technical co-founder, someone who wants skin in the game. I love that. Yeah. I, and are there like pitch pitch events and stuff? I don't have, I, I currently don't have any lined up right now. I, I'm ready. So I, I mean, I have, I have my deck made. I, <sighs> it, I, I kind of, I, I feel like that. I feel like I'm an unleashed, un, un, unlet, wow, unfired cannon right now. Um, and so I, down the line after, after this intellectual property is protected, I would love to, to go to Good. dig into hormones with you. That would be Good. a super fun conversation. We will. we will. We'll do a round two. And uh, I spent about eight months in the Silicon Valley area years ago. Amazing. Just because of this, I wanted to learn what does it take to do tech stuff? You know, what is, what is a VC, an angel investor? I talked to a bunch of them and they gave me some very interesting tips and things that you only learn if you're in Silicon Valley. Yep. No one else really knows this stuff. So um, anytime, Rachel. Thank you. You have, uh, I mean, I believe in you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank I, you. I fully believe in you. And uh, you're worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day. I know you have clients and tr- your own training. And I mean, you're moving soon, you know, back to Boston. So uh, taking time out and, and being here for the podcast, you, massive, massive value. Thank you for giving us a chance to go deep into your <laughs> your 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 story and, and all the love that you've shared. And thank you so much. And I, I hope you have the most successful, most fun company and you just change the world. Thank you. That means so much. And it's just such a joy seeing seeing you and Marta at, at the gym every day. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to get to know you more too. We've we've had so many maybe five or ten minuters in passing and what what a luxury this has been. So I can't thank you enough. And thank you for just sharing people's stories and, and your own passions with, and your own tools with, with the world too. So thank you so much, Farhan. 